Byways of Europe, A Visit to the Balearic Islands, by James Thomas Fields. British and American Periodical Articles, 1852 to 1905, by Various. Section 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Byways of Europe, a visit to the Balearic Islands, by James Thomas Fields. As the steamer Mallorca slowly moved out of the harbor of Barcelona, I made a rapid inspection of the passengers gathered on deck, and found that I was the only foreigner among them. Almost without exception, they were native Mallorcans, returning from trips of business or pleasure to the continent. They spoke no language except Spanish and Catalan, and held fast to all the little habits and fashions of their insular life. If anything more had been needed to show me that I was entering upon untrodden territory, it was supplied by the joyous surprise of the steward when I gave him a fee. This fact reconciled me to my isolation on board, and its attendant awkwardness. I knew not why I should have chosen to visit the Balearic Islands, unless for the simple reason that they lie so much aside from the highways of travel, and are not represented in the journals and sketch-books of tourists. If any one had asked me what I expected to see, I should have been obliged to confess my ignorance, for the few dry geographical details which I possessed were like the chemical analysis of a liquor, wherefrom no one can reconstruct the taste. The flavor of a land is a thing quite apart from its statistics. There is no special guide-book for the islands, and the slight notices in the works on Spain only betray the haste of the authors to get over a field with which they are unacquainted. But this very circumstance, for me, had grown into a fascination. One gets tired of studying the bill of fare in advance of the repast. When the sun and the Spanish coast had set together behind the placid sea, I went to my berth with a delightful certainty that the sun of the morrow, and of many days thereafter, would rise upon scenes and adventures which could not be anticipated. The distance from Barcelona to Palma is about a hundred and forty miles, so the morning found us skirting the southwestern extremity of Mallorca, a barren coast thrusting low headlands of grey rock into the sea and hills covered with parched and stunted chaparral in the rear. The twelfth century, in the shape of a crumbling Moorish watch-tower, alone greeted us. As we advanced eastward into the Bay of Palma, however, the wild shrubbery melted into plantations of olive, solitary houses of fishermen nestled in the coves, and finally a village of those soft ochre tents, which are a little brighter than the soil, appeared on the slope of a hill. In front, through the pale morning mist which still lay upon the sea, I saw the cathedral of Palma looming grand and large beside the towers of other churches, and presently, gliding past a mile or two of country villas and gardens, we entered the crowded harbor. Inside the mole there was a multitude of the light craft of the Mediterranean, Zebex, Falucas, Speronaras, or however they may be termed, with here and there a brigantine which had come from beyond the pillars of Hercules. Our steamer drew into her berth beside the quay, and after a very deliberate review by the port physician we were allowed to land. I found a porter, Arab in everything but costume, and followed him through the water gate into the half-awake city. My destination was the inn of the Four Nations, where I was cordially received, and afterwards roundly swindled by a French host. My first demand was for a native attendant, not so much from any need of guide as simply to become more familiar with the people through him. But I was told that no such serviceable spirit was to be had in the place. Strangers are so rare that a class of people who live upon them has not yet been created. But how shall I find the palace of the government, or the monastery of San Domingo, or anything else? I asked. 
"'Oh, we will give you directions, so you cannot miss them,' said the host. But he laid before me such a confusion of right turnings and left turnings, ups and downs, that I became speedily bewildered, and set forth, determined to let the spirit in my feet guide me. A labyrinthine place is Palma, and my first walks through the city were so many games of chance." the streets are very narrow changing their direction it seemed to me at every tenth step and whatever landmark one may select at the start is soon shut from view by the high dark houses at first i was quite astray but little by little i regained the lost points of the compass after having had the phoenicians greeks carthaginians romans vandals and saracens as masters majorca was first made Spanish by King Jaime of Aragon, the conquistador, in the year 1235. For a century after the conquest, it was an independent kingdom, and one of its kings was slain by the English bowmen at the Battle of Crecy. The Spanish element has absorbed, but not yet entirely obliterated, the characteristics of the earlier races who inhabited the island. Were ethnology a more positively developed science, we might divide and classify this confused inheritance of character. As it is, we vaguely feel the presence of something quaint, antique, and unusual in walking the streets of Palma and mingling with the inhabitants. The traces of Moorish occupation are still noticeable everywhere. Although the Saracenic architecture no longer exists in its original forms, its details may be detected in portals, courtyards, and balconies in almost every street. The conquerors endeavor to remodel the city, but in doing so they preserve the very spirit which they sought to destroy. My wanderings, after all, were not wholly undirected. I found an intelligent guide, who was at the same time an old acquaintance. The whirligig of time brings about not merely its revenges, but also its compensations and coincidences. Twenty-two years ago, when I was studying German as a boy in the old city of Frankfurt, guests from the south of France came to visit the amiable family with whom I was residing. There were Monsieur Laurens, a painter and a musical enthusiast, his wife, and Mademoiselle Rosalba, a daughter as fair as her name. Never shall I forget the curious letter which the artist wrote to the manager of the theatre, requesting that Beethoven's Fidelio might be given, and it was, for his own especial benefit, nor the triumphant air with which he came to us one day, saying, I have something of most precious, and brought forth, out of a dozen protecting envelopes, a single gray hair from Beethoven's head. Nor shall I forget how Madame Laurens taught us French plays, and how the fair Rosalba declaimed André Chagnier to redeem her pawns. But I might have forgotten all these things, had it not been for an old volume which turned up at need, and which gave me information, at once clear, precise, and attractive, concerning the streets and edifices of Palma. The round, solid head, earnest eyes, and abstracted air of the painter came forth distinct from the limbo of things overlaid, but never lost, and went with me through the checkered blaze and gloom of the city. The monastery of San Domingo, which was the headquarters of the Inquisition, was spared by the progressive government of Mendizabal, but destroyed by the people. Its ruins must have been the most picturesque sight of Palma, but since the visit of Monsieur Laurens, they have been removed, and their broken vaults and revealed torture chambers are no longer to be seen. There are, however, two or three buildings of more than ordinary interest. The Casa Consistorial, or City Hall, is a massive Palladian pile of the sixteenth century, resembling the old palaces of Pisa and Florence, except in the circumstance that its roof projects at least ten feet beyond the front, resting on a massive cornice of carved wood with curious horizontal caryatids in the place of brackets. The rich burnt sienna tent of the carvings contrasts finely with the golden brown of the massive marble walls, a combination which is shown in no other building of the Middle Ages. 
The sunken rosettes, surrounded by raised arabesque borders between the caryatids, are sculpted with such a careful reference to the distance at which they must be seen that they appear as firm and delicate as if near the spectator's eye. The cathedral, founded by the conquistador, and built upon, at intervals, for more than three centuries, is not yet finished. It stands upon a natural platform of rock overhanging the sea, where its grand dimensions produce the greatest possible effect. In every view of Palma, it towers solidly above the houses and bastioned walls, and insists upon having the sky as a background for the light Gothic pinnacles of its flying buttresses. The government has recently undertaken its restoration, and a new front of very admirable and harmonious design is about half completed. The soft amber-colored marble of Majorca is enriched in tint by exposure to the air, and even when built in large unrelieved masses retains a bright and cheerful character. The new portion of the cathedral, like the old, has but little sculpture, except in the portals, but that little is so elegant that a greater profusion of ornament would seem out of place. Passing from the clear, dazzling day into the interior, one finds himself, at first, in total darkness, and the dimensions of the nave, nearly three hundred feet in length by one hundred and forty in height, are amplified by the gloom. The wind, I was told, came through the windows on the seaside with such force as to overturn the chalices and blow out the tapers on the altar, whereupon every opening was walled up, except a rose at the end of the chancel, and a few slits in the nave, above the side aisles. A somber twilight, like that of a stormy day, fills the edifice. Here the rustling of stoles and the muttering of prayers suggests incantation rather than worship. The organ has a hollow, sepulchral sound of lamentation, and there is a spirit of mystery and terror in the stale, clammy air. The place resembles an antechamber of purgatory much more than of heaven. The mummy of Don Jaime the Second, son of the conquistador and first king of Majorca, is preserved in a sarcophagus of black marble. This is the only historic monument in the cathedral, unless the stranger chooses to study the heraldry of the island families from their shields suspended in the chapels. When I returned to the Four Nations for breakfast, I found at the table a gentleman of Palma, who invited me to sit down and partake of his meal. For the first time, the Spanish custom, which really seems picturesque and fraternal, when coming from shepherds or muleteers in a mountain inn, struck me as the hollowest of forms. The gentleman knew that I would not accept his invitation, nor he mine. He knew, moreover, that I knew he did not wish me to accept it. The phrase, under such conditions, becomes a cheat which offends the sacred spirit of hospitality. How far the mere form may go was experienced by George Sand, who, having accepted the use of a carriage more earnestly offered to her by a Majorcan count, found the equipage at her door, it is true, but with it a letter expressing so much vexation that she was forced to withdraw her acceptance of the favor at once, and to apologize for it. I have always found much hospitality among the common people of Spain, and I doubt not that the spirit exists in all classes but it requires some practice to distinguish between empty phrase and the courtesy which comes from the heart. A people who boast of some special virtue generally do not possess it. My own slight intercourse with the Majorcans was very pleasant. On the day of my arrival I endeavored to procure a map of the island, but none of the bookstores possessed the article. It could be found in one house in a remote street and one of the shopmen finally sent a boy with me to the very door. When I offered money for the service, my guide smiled, shook his head, and ran away. The map was more than fifty years old, and drawn in the style of two centuries ago, with groups of houses for the villages, and long files of conical peaks for the mountains. The woman brought it down, yellow and dusty, from a dark garret over the shop, and seemed as delighted with the sale as if she had received money for useless stock. In the streets, the people in 
inspected me curiously as a stranger but were always ready to go out of their way to guide me the ground floor being always open all the features of the domestic life and of mechanical labor are exposed to the public the housewives the masters and apprentices busy as they seem manage to keep one eye disengaged and no one passes before them without notice cooking washing sewing tailoring shoemaking coopering rope and basket making succeed each other as one passes through the narrow streets in the afternoon the mechanics frequently come forth and set up their businesses in the open air where they can now and then greet a country acquaintance or a city friend or sweetheart when i found that the ruins of san domingo had been removed and a statue of isabella ii erected on the alameda i began to suspect that the reign of old things was over in majorca a little observation of the people made this fact more evident the island costume is no longer worn by the young men even in the country they have passed into a very comical transition state old men mounted on lean asses or mules still enter the gates of palma with handkerchiefs tied over their shaven crowns and long gray locks falling on their shoulders with short loose jackets shawls around the waist and wide turkish trousers gathered at the knee their gaunt brown legs are bare and their feet protected by rude sandals tall large-boned and stern of face they hint both of vandal and of moslem blood the younger men are of inferior stature and nearly all bow-legged they have turned the flowing trousers into modern pantaloons the legs of which are cut like the old-fashioned jigo sleeve very big and baggy at the top and tied with a drawing string around the waist my first impression was that the men had got up in a great hurry and put on their trousers hinder in foremost it would be difficult to invent a costume more awkward and ungraceful than this in the city the young girls wear a large triangular piece of white or black lace which covers the hair and tightly encloses the face being fastened under the chin and the ends brought down to a point on the breast their almond-shaped eyes are large and fine but there is very little positive beauty among them most of the old country women are veritable hags and their appearance is not improved by the broad-brimmed stove-pipe hats which they wear seated astride on their donkeys between panniers of produce they come in daily from the plains and mountains and you encounter them on all the roads leading out of palma few of the people speak any other language than majorcan a variety of the catalan which from the frequency of the terminations in ch and z consistently suggests the old provencal literature the word vich son is both celtic and slavonic some arabic terms are also retained though fewer i think than in andalusia in the afternoon i walked out into the country the wall on the land side which is very high and massive is pierced by five guarded gates the dry moat both wide and deep is spanned by wooden bridges after crossing which one has the choice of a dozen highways all scantily shaded with rows of ragged mulberry trees glaring white in the sun and deep in impalpable dry dust but the sea breeze blows freshening across the parched land shadows of light clouds cool the arid mountains in the distance the olives roll into silvery undulations a palm in full rejoicing plumage rustles over your head and the huge spatulate leaves of a banana in the nearest garden twist and split into fringes there is no languor in the air no sleep in the deluge of sunshine the landscape is active with signs of work and travel wheat wine olives almonds and oranges are produced not only side by side but from the same fields and the painfully thorough system of cultivation leaves not a rood of the soil unused i had chosen at random a road which led me west toward the nearest mountains and in the course of an hour i found myself at the entrance of a valley solitary farmhouses each as massive as the tower of a fortress and the color of sunburnt gold studded the heights overlooking the long slopes of almond orchards i looked about for water 
in order to make a sketch of the scene, but the bed of the brook was as dry as the highway. The nearest house toward the plain had a splendid sentinel palm beside its door, a dream of Egypt, which beckoned and drew me towards it with a glamour I could not resist. Over the wall of the garden the orange trees lifted their mounds of impenetrable foliage, and the blossoms of the pomegranates, sprinkled against such a background, were like coals of fire. The fig-bearing cactus grew about the house in clumps twenty feet high, covered with pale yellow flowers. The building was large and roomy, with a courtyard, around which ran a shaded gallery. The farmer who was issuing therefrom, as I approached, wore the shawl and Turkish trousers of the old generation, while his two sons, reaping in the adjoining wheat fields, were hideous in the modern gigots. Although I was manifestly an intruder, the old man greeted me respectfully, and passed on to his work. Three boys tended a drove of black hogs in the stubble, and some women were so industriously weeding and hoeing in the field beyond that they scarcely stopped to cast a glance upon the stranger. There was a grateful air of peace, order, and contentment about the place, but no one seemed to be suspicious or even surprised when I seated myself upon a low wall and watched the laborers. The knoll upon which the farmhouse stood sloped down gently into the broad, rich plain of Palma, extending many a league to the eastward. Its endless orchards made a dim horizon line, over which rose the solitary double-headed mountain of Falaniche, and the tops of some peaks near Arta. The city wall was visible on my right, and beyond it a bright arc of the Mediterranean. The features of the landscape, in fact, were so simple that I fear I cannot make its charm evident to the reader. Looking over the nearer fields, I observed two peculiarities of Majorca, upon which depends much of the prosperity of the island. The wheat is certainly, as it is claimed to be, the finest of any Mediterranean land. Its large, perfect grains furnish a flour of such fine quality that the whole produce of the island is sent to Spain for the pastry and confectionery of the cities while the Majorcans import a cheap, inferior kind in its place. Their fortune depends on their abstinence from the good things which Providence has given them. Their pork is greatly superior to that of Spain, and it leaves them in like manner. Their best wines are now bought up by speculators and exported for the fabrication of sherry. And their oil, which might be the finest in the world, is so injured by imperfect methods of preservation that it might pass for the worst. These things, however, give them no annoyance. Southern races are sometimes indolent, but rarely epicurean in their habits. It is the northern man who sighs for his flesh-pots. I walked forward between the fields toward another road, and came upon a tract which had just been ploughed and planted for a new crop. The soil was ridged in a labyrinthine pattern, which appeared to have been drawn with square and rule. But more remarkable than this was the difference of level, so slight that the eye could not possibly detect it, which the slender irrigating streams were conducted to every square foot of the field, without a drop being needlessly wasted. The system is an inheritance from the Moors, who were the best natural engineers the world has ever known. Water is scarce in Majorca, and thus every stream, spring, rainfall, even the dew of heaven, is utilized. Channels of masonry, often covered to prevent evaporation, descend from the mountains, branch into narrower veins, and visit every farm on the plain, whatever may be its level. Where these are not sufficient, the rains are added to the reservoir, or a string of buckets, turned by a mule, lifts the water from a well but it is in the economy of distributing water to the fields that the most marvelous skill is exhibited. The grade of the surface must not only be preserved, but the subtle, tricksy spirit of water so delicately understood and humored that the streams shall traverse the greatest amount of soil with the least waste or wear. In this respect, the most skillful application of science could not surpass the achievements of the Majorcan farmers. 
Working my way homeward through the tangled streets, I was struck with the universal sound of wailing which filled the city. All the tailors, shoemakers, and basket makers at work in the open air were singing, rarely in measured strains, but with wild, irregular, lamentable cries, exactly in the manner of the Arabs. Sometimes the song was antiphonal, flung back and forth from the farthest visible corners of a street, and then it became a contest of lungs, kept up for an hour at a time. While breakfasting, I had heard, as I supposed, a miserere chanted by some procession of monks, and wondered when the doleful strains would cease. I now saw that they came from the mouths of some cheerful coopers, who were heading barrels a little farther down the street. The Majorcans still have their troubadours, who are hired by languishing lovers to improvise strains of longing or reproach under the windows of the fair, and perhaps the latter may listen with delight, but I know of no place where the enraged musician would so soon become insane. The isle is full of noises, and a Caliban might say that they hurt not. For me they murdered sleep, both at midnight and at dawn. I had decided to devote my second day to an excursion to the mountain paradise of Valdemosa, and sailed forth early to seek the means of conveyance. Up to this time I had been worried, tortured, I may say, without exaggeration, by desperate efforts to recover the Spanish tongue, which I had not spoken for fourteen years. I still had the sense of possessing it, but in some old drawer of memory, the lock of which had rusted and would not obey the key. Like Mrs. Dombey, I felt as if there were Spanish words somewhere in the room, but I could not positively say that I had them, a sensation which, as everybody knows, is far worse than absolute ignorance. I had taken a carriage for Valdemosa, after a long talk with the proprietor, a most agreeable fellow, when I suddenly stopped and exclaimed to myself, You are talking Spanish. Did you know it? It was even so. As much of the language as I ever knew was suddenly and unaccountably restored to me. On my return to the Four Nations, I was still further surprised to find myself repeating songs, without the failure of a line or word, which I had learned from a Mexican as a schoolboy, and had not thought of for twenty years. The unused drawer had somehow been unlocked, or broken open while I slept. Valdemosa is about twelve miles north of Palma, in the heart of the only mountain chain of the island, which forms its western, or rather northwestern, coast. The average altitude of these mountains will not exceed three thousand feet, but the broken, abrupt character of their outlines, and the naked glare of their immense precipitous walls, give them that intrinsic grandeur which does not depend on measurement. In their geological formation they resemble the Pyrenees, the rocks are of that palombino, or dove-colored, limestone, so common in Sicily and the Grecian islands. Pale, bluish-gray, taking a soft orange tint on the faces most exposed to the weather. Rising directly from the sea on the west, they cease almost as suddenly on the land side, leaving all the central portion of the island a plain, slightly inclined toward the southeast, where occasional peaks or irregular groups of hills interrupt its monotony. In due time my team made its appearance, an omnibus of basket-work, with a canvas cover, drawn by two horses. It had space enough for twelve persons, yet was the smallest vehicle I could discover. There appears to be nothing between it and the two-wheeled cart of the peasant, which, on a pinch, carries six or eight. For an hour and a half we traversed the teeming plain, between stacks of wheat worthy to be laid on the altar of Eleusis, carob trees with their dark, varnished foliage, almond orchards bending under the weight of their green nuts, and the country houses with their garden clumps of orange, cactus, and palm. As we drew near the base of the mountains, olive trees of great size and luxuriance covered the earth with a fine sprinkle of shade. Their gnarled and knotted trunks, a thousand years old, were frequently split into three or four distinct and separate trees, which in the process assumed forms so marvelously human in their distortion that I could scarcely believe them to be accidental. Doré never drew anything so weird and grotesque. Here were two club-headed individuals, writing, with interlocked knees, convulsed shoulders, and fists full of each other's hair, 
Yonder a bully was threatening attack, and three cowards appeared to be running away from him with such speed that they were tumbling over one another's heels. In one place a horrible dragon was devouring a squirming, shapeless animal. In another a drunken man, with whirling arms and tangled feet, was pitching forward upon his face. The living wood in Dante was tame beside these astonishing trees. We now entered a wild ravine, where, nevertheless, the mountainsides, sheer and savage as they were, had succumbed to the rule of man, and nourished an olive or a carob tree on every corner of earth between the rocks. The road was built along the edge of the deep, dry bed of a winter stream, so narrow that a single arch carried it from side to side, as the windings of the glen compelled. After climbing thus for a mile in the shadows of threatening masses of rock, an amphitheater of gardens, enframed by the spurs of two grand arid mountains, opened before us. The bed of the valley was filled with vines and orchards, beyond which rose long terraces, dark with orange and citron trees, obelisks of cypress and magnificent groups of palm, with the long white front and shaded balconies of a hacienda between. Far up, on a higher plateau between the peaks, I saw the church tower of Valdemosa. The sides of the mountains were terraced with almost incredible labor, walls massive as the rock itself being raised to a height of thirty feet, to gain a shelf of soil two or three yards in breadth. Where the olive and carob ceased, box and ilex took possession of the inaccessible points, carrying up the long waves of vegetation until their foam sprinkles of silver-gray faded out among the highest clefts. The natural channels of the rock were straightened and made to converge at the base, so that not a wandering cloud could bathe the wild growths of the summit without being caught and hurried into some tank below. The wilderness was forced, by pure toil, to become a paradise, and each stubborn feature, which toil could not subdue, now takes its place as a contrast and an ornament in the picture. Verily, there is nothing in all Italy so beautiful as Valamosa. Lest I should be thought extravagant in my delight, let me give you some words of George Sand, which I have since read. I have never seen, she says, anything so bright, and at the same time so melancholy, as these perspectives, where the ilex, the carob, pine, olive, poplar, and cypress mingle their various hues in the hollows of the mountain, abysses of verdure, where the torrent precipitates its course under mounds of sumptuous richness and inimitable grace. While you hear the sound of the sea on the northern coast, you perceive it only as a faint shining line beyond the sinking mountains and the great plain which is unrolled to the southward, a sublime picture framed in the foreground by dark rocks covered with pines, in the middle distance by mountains of boldest outline fringed with superb trees, and beyond these by rounded hills which the setting sun gilds with burning colors where the eye distinguishes a league away the microscopic profile of trees fine as the antenna of butterflies black and clear as pen drawings of india ink on a ground of sparkling gold it is one of those landscapes which oppress you because they leave nothing to be desired nothing to be imagined nature has here created that which the poet and the painter behold in their dreams an immense ensemble, infinite details, inexhaustible variety, blended forms, sharp contours, dim, vanishing depths, all are present, and art can suggest nothing further. Majorca is one of the most beautiful countries of the world for the painter, and one of the least known. It is a green Helvetia under the sky of Calabria, with the solemnity and silence of the Orient." Unquote. The village of Valdemosa is a picturesque, rambling place, brown with age, and buried in the foliage of fig and orange trees. The highest part of the narrow plateau where it stands is crowned by the church and monastery of the Trappists, Cartusa, now deserted. My coachman drove under the open roof of a venta and began to unharness his horses.
the family who were dining at a table so low that they appeared to be sitting on the floor gave me the customary invitation to join them and when i asked for a glass of wine brought me one which held nearly a quart i could not long turn my back on the bright wonderful landscape without so taking books and colors i entered the lonely cloisters of the monastery Followed first by one small boy, I had a retinue of at least fifteen children before I had completed the tour of the church, courtyard, and the long-drawn, shady corridors of the silent monks, and when I took my seat on the stones at the foot of the towers, with the very scene described by Georges Sand before my eyes, a number of older persons added themselves to the group. A woman brought me a chair, and the children then planted themselves in a dense row before me, while I attempted to sketch under such difficulties as I had never known before. Precisely because I am no artist, it makes me nervous to be watched while drawing, and the remarks of the young men on this occasion were not calculated to give me courage. When I had roughly mapped out the sky with its few floating clouds, someone exclaimed, "'He has finished the mountains!' there they are and they all crowded around me saying yes there are the mountains while i was really engaged upon the mountains there was a violent discussion as to what they might be and i don't know how long it would have lasted had i not turned to some cypresses nearer the foreground then a young man cried out oh that's a cypress i wonder if he will make them all how many are there one two three four five yes he makes five there was an immediate rush shutting out earth and heaven from my sight and they all cried in chorus one two three four five yes he has made five cavaliers and ladies i said with solemn politeness have the goodness not to stand before me to be sure santa maria how do you think he can see yelled an old woman and the children were hustled away but I thereby won the ill-will of those garlic-breathing and scratching imps, for very soon a shower of water-drops fell upon my paper. Next a stick, thrown from an upper window, dropped on my head, and more than once my elbow was intentionally jogged from behind. The older people scolded and threatened, but young Majorca was evidently against me. I therefore made haste to finish my impotent mimicry of air and light, and get away from the curious crowd. Behind the village there is a gleam of the sea, near yet at an unknown depth. As I threaded the walled lanes, seeking some point of view, a number of lusty young fellows, mounted on unsaddled mules, passed me with a courteous greeting on one side rose a grand pile of rock covered with ilex trees a bit of scenery so admirable that i fell into a new temptation i climbed a little knoll and looked around me far and near no children were to be seen the portico of an unfinished house offered both shade and seclusion i concealed myself behind a pillar and went to work for half an hour i was happy then a round black head popped up over a garden wall a small brown form crept towards me beckoned, and presently a new multitude had assembled. The noise they made provoked a sound of cursing from the interior of a stable adjoining the house. They only made a louder tumult in answer. The voice became more threatening, and at the end of five minutes the door burst open. An old man, with wrath flashing from his eyes, came forth. The children took to their heels. I greeted the newcomer politely, but he hardly returned the salutation. He was a very fountain of curses, and now hurled stones with them after the fugitives. When they had all disappeared behind the walls, he went back to his den, grumbling and muttering. It was not five minutes, however, before the children were back again, as noisy as before. So, at the first thunder from the stable, I shut up my book and returned to the inn. While the horses were being harnessed, I tried to talk with an old native, who wore the island costume, and was as grim and grisly as Asawatomi Brown. A party of country people from the plains, who seemed to have come up to Valdemosa on a pleasure trip, clambered into a two-wheeled cart drawn by one mule, and drove away. My old friend gave me the distances of various places, the state of the roads, and the quality of the wine but he seemed to have no conception of the world outside of the island. Indeed, to a native of the village, whose fortune 
has simply placed him beyond the reach of want, what is the rest of the world? Around and before him spread one of its loveliest pictures. He breathes its purest air, and he may enjoy its best luxuries, if he heeds or knows how to use them. Up to this day the proper spice and flavor had been wanting. Palma had only interest me, but in Valdemosa I found the inspiration, the heat and play of vivid, keen sensation, which one, often somewhat unreasonably, expects from a new land. As my carriage descended, winding around the sides of the magnificent mountain amphitheater, in the alternate shadows of palm and ilex, pine and olive, I looked back, clinging to every marvelous picture, and saying to myself, over and over again, I have not come hither in vain. When the last shattered gate of rock closed behind me, and the wood of insane olive trunks was passed, with what other eyes I looked upon the rich orchard plain, it had now become a part of one superb whole, and as the background of my mountain view, it had caught a new glory and still wore the bloom of the invisible sea. In the evening I reached the Four Nations, where I was needlessly invited to dinner by certain strangers, and dined alone on meats cooked in rancid oil. When the cook had dished the last course, he came into a room adjoining the dining apartment, sat down to a piano in his white cap, and played loud, long, and badly. The landlord had papered this room with illustrations from all the periodicals of Europe. Dancing girls pointed their toes under cardinals' hats, and bulls were baited before the shrines of saints. Mixed with the woodcuts were the landlord's own artistic productions, wonderful to behold. All the house was proud of this room, and with reason, for there is assuredly no other room like it in the world. A notice in four languages, written with extraordinary flourishes, announced in the English division that travelers will find confortation and modest prices. The former advantage, I discovered, consisted in the art of the landlord, the music and oil of the cook and the attendance of a servant so distant that it was easier to serve myself than seek him. The latter may have been modest for Palma, but in any other place they would have been considered brazenly impertinent. I should therefore advise travelers to try the three pigeons in the same street rather than the four nations. The next day, under the guidance of my old friend, Monsieur Lawrence, I wandered for several hours through the streets, peeping into courtyards, looking over garden walls, or idling under the trees of the Alameda. There are no pleasant suburban places of resort, such as are to be found in all other Spanish cities. The country commences on the other side of the moat. Three small cafés exist, but cannot be said to flourish, for I never saw more than one table occupied. A theatre has been built, but is only open during the winter, of course. Some placards on the walls, however, announced that the national, that is, Mallorcan, diversion of baiting bulls with dogs would be given in a few days. The noblesse appeared to be even haughtier than in Spain, perhaps on account of their greater poverty, and much more of the feudal spirit lingers among them and gives character to society than on the mainland. Each family has still a crowd of retainers who perform a certain amount of service on the estates and are thenceforth entitled to support. This custom is the reverse of profitable, but it keeps up an air of lordship and is therefore retained. Late in the afternoon, when the new portion of the Alameda is in shadow, and swept by a delicious breeze from the sea, it begins to be frequented by the people. But I noticed that very few of the upper class made their appearance. So grave and somber are these latter, that one would fancy them descended from the conquered Moors rather than the Spanish conquerors. Monsieur Lawrence is of the opinion that the architecture of Palma cannot be ascribed to an earlier period than the beginning of the sixteenth century. I am satisfied, however, either that many fragments of Moorish sculpture must have been used in the erection of the older buildings, or that certain peculiarities of Moorish art have been closely imitated. For instance, that Moorish combination of vast, heavy masses of masonry with the lightest and airiest style of ornament, which the Gothic sometimes attempts, 
but never with the same success, is here found at every step. I will borrow M. Laurent's words, descriptive of the superior class of edifices, both because I can find no better of my own, and because this very characteristic has been noticed by him. Quote, Above the ground floor, he says, there is only one story and a low garret. The entrance is a semicircular portal without ornament, but the number and dimensions of the stones, disposed in long radii, give it a stately aspect. The grand halls of the main story are lighted by windows divided by excessively slender columns, which are entirely Arabic in appearance. This character is so pronounced that I was obliged to examine more than twenty houses constructed in the same manner, and to study all the details of their construction in order to assure myself that the windows had not really been taken from those very moresque palaces of which the Alhambra is the only remaining specimen. Except in Majorca, I have nowhere seen columns which, with a height of six feet, have a diameter of only three inches. The fine grain of the marble of which they are made, as well as the delicacy of the capitals, led me to suppose them to be of Saracenic origin." Unquote. I was more impressed by the Longe, or Exchange, than any other building in Palma. It dates from the first half of the fifteenth century, when the kings of the island had built up a flourishing commerce, and expected to rival Genoa and Venice. Its walls, once crowded with merchants and seamen, are now only open for the carnival balls and other festivals sanctioned by religion. It is a square edifice with light Gothic towers at the corners, displaying little ornamental sculpture, but nevertheless a taste and symmetry in all its details, which are very rare in Spanish architecture. The interior is a single, vast hall, with a groined roof, resting on six pillars of exquisite beauty. They are sixty feet high, and fluted spirally from top to bottom, like a twisted cord, with a diameter of not more than two feet and a half. It is astonishing how the airy lightness and grace of these pillars relieve the immense mass of masonry, spare the bare walls the necessity of ornament, and make the ponderous roof light as a tent. There is here the trace of a law of which our modern architects seem to be ignorant. Large masses of masonry are always oppressive in their effect. They suggest pain and labor, and the Saracens, even more than the Greeks, seem to have discovered the necessity of introducing a sportive, fanciful element which shall express the delight of the workman in his work. In the afternoon I sallied forth from the western coast gate, and found there, sloping to the shore, a village inhabited apparently by sailors and fishermen. The houses were of one story, flat-roofed, and brilliantly whitewashed. Against the blue background of the sea, with here and there the huge fronds of a palm rising from among them, they made a truly African picture. On the brown ridge above the village were fourteen huge windmills, nearly all in motion. I found a road leading, along the brink of the overhanging cliffs, toward the castle of Belver, whose brown medieval turrets rose against a gathering thundercloud. This fortress, built as a palace for the kings of Majorca immediately after the expulsion of the Moors, is now a prison. It has a superb situation, on the summit of a conical hill covered with umbrella pines. In one of its round, massive towers, Arago was imprisoned for two months in 1808. He was at the time employed in measuring an arc of the meridian when news of Napoleon's violent measures in Spain reached Majorca. The ignorant populace immediately suspected the astronomer of being a spy and political agent, and would have lynched him at once. Warned by a friend, he disguised himself as a sailor, escaped on board a boat in the harbor, and was then placed in Belver by the authorities in order to save his life. He afterwards succeeded in reaching Algiers, where he was seized by order of the bay, and made to work as a slave. Few men of science have known so much of the romance of life. I had a long walk to Belver, but I was rewarded by a grand view of the bay of Palma, the city, and all the southern extremity of the island. I endeavored to get into the fields, 
to seek other points of view, but they were surrounded by such lofty walls that I fancied the owners of the soil could only get at them by scaling ladders. The grain and trees on either side of the road were hoary with dust, and the soil of the hue of burnt chalk seemed never to have known moisture. But while I loitered on the cliffs, the cloud in the west had risen and spread. A cold wind blew over the hills, and the high gray peaks behind Valdemosa disappeared one by one in a veil of rain. A rough tartana, which performed the service of an omnibus, passed me returning to the city, and the driver, having no passengers, invited me to ride. "'What is your fare?' I asked. "'Whatever people choose to give,' said he, which was reasonable enough, and I thus reached the Four Nations in time to avoid a deluge. The Majorcans are fond of claiming their island as the birthplace of Hannibal. There are some remains supposed to be Carthaginian near the town of Alcudia, but, singularly enough, not a fragment to tell of the Roman domination, although their Balearis major must have been, then, as now, a rich and important possession. The Saracens, rather than the Vandals, have been the spoilers of ancient art. Their religious detestation of sculpture was at the bottom of this destruction. The Christians could consecrate the old temple to a new service, and give the names of saints to the statues of the gods, but to the Moslem every representation of the human form was worse than blasphemy. For this reason, the symbols of the most ancient faith, massive and unintelligible, have outlived the monuments of those which followed. In a forest of ancient oaks near the village of Arta, there still exist a number of Cyclopean constructions, the character of which is as uncertain as the date of their erection. They are cones of huge irregular blocks, the jams and lintels of the entrances being of single stones. In a few the opening is at the top, with rude projections resembling a staircase to aid in the descent. Cinerary urns have been found in some of them, yet they do not appear to have been originally constructed as tombs. The Romans may have afterwards turned them to that surface. In the vicinity there are the remains of a druid circle, of large upright monoliths. These singular structures were formerly much more numerous. The people, who called them the altars of the Gentiles, having destroyed a great many in building the village and the neighboring farmhouses. I heard a great deal about a cavern on the eastern coast of the island, beyond Arta. It is called the Hermit's Cave, and the people of Palma consider it the principal thing to be seen in all Mallorca. Their descriptions of the place, however, did not inspire me with any very lively desire to undertake a two days' journey for the purpose of crawling on my belly through a long hole and then descending a shaky rope ladder for a hundred feet or more. When one has performed these feats, they say, he finds himself in an immense hall, supported by stalactic pillars, the marvels of which cannot be described. Had the scenery of the eastern part of the island been more attractive, I should have gone as far as Arta, but I wished to meet the steamer Minorca at Alcudia, and there were but two days remaining. End of Byways of Europe A Visit to the Balearic Islands by James Thomas Fields, editor, Atlantic Monthly, 1867. The Eye of India from Modern India by William Ellaroy Curtis. British and American Periodical Articles, 1852 to 1905 by Various. Section 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. A voyage to India nowadays is a continuous social event. The passengers compose a house party, being guests of the steamship company for the time. The decks of the steamer are like broad verandas and are covered with comfortable chairs in which the owners lounge about all day. Some of the more industrious women knit and embroider, and I saw one good mother with a basket full of mending, at which she was busily engaged at least three mornings. Others play cards upon folding tables or write letters with portfolios on their laps, and we had several artists 
who sketched the sky and sea, but the majority read novels and guide-books, and gossiped. As birds of a feather flocked together, on the sea, as well as on land, previous acquaintances and congenial new ones formed little circles and cliques, and entertained themselves and each other, and, after a day or two, move their chairs around, so that they can be together. Americans and English do not mix as readily as you might expect, although there is nothing like coolness between them. It is only a natural restraint. They are accustomed to their ways, and we to ours, and it is natural for us to drift toward our own fellow countrymen. In the afternoon nettings are hung around one of the broad decks, and games of cricket are played. One day it is the army against the navy, another day the united service against a civilian team, and then the cricketers in the second-class salon are invited to come forward and try their skill against a team made up of first-classers. In the evening there is dancing, a piano being placed upon the deck for that purpose, and for two hours it is very gay. The ladies are all in white, and several Englishwomen insisted upon coming out on the deck in low-cut and short-sleeved gowns. It is said to be the latest fashion, and is not half as bad as their cigarette-smoking or the ostentatious display of jewelry that is made on the deck every morning. Several women, and some of them with titles, sprawl around in steamer-chairs wearing necklaces of pearls, diamonds, emeralds, and other precious stones, fit for only a banquet or a ball with their fingers blazing with jewels and their wrists covered with bracelets. There seemed to be a rivalry among the aristocracy on our steamer as to which could make the most vulgar display of gold, silver, and precious stones, and it occurs to me that these English women had lived in India so long that they must have acquired the Hindu barbaric love of jewelry. My attention was called not long ago to a cartoon in a British illustrated paper comparing the traveling outfits of American and English girls. The American girl had a carload of trunks and bags and bundles, a big bunch of umbrellas and parasols, golf sticks, tennis rackets, and all sorts of queer things, and was dressed in a most conspicuous and elaborate manner. She was represented as striding up and down a railway platform covered with diamonds, boa, flashy hat, and fancy finery, while the English girl, in a close-fitting ulster and an alpine hat, leaned quietly upon her umbrella near a small box, as they call a trunk, and a modest traveling bag. But that picture isn't accurate. According to my observation, it ought to be reversed. I have never known the most vulgar of the commonest American woman to make such a display of herself in a public place as we witness daily among the titled women upon the P&O steamer Mongolia bound for Bombay. Nor is it exceptional. Whenever you see an overdressed woman loaded with jewelry in a public place in the East, you may take it for granted that she belongs to the British nobility. Germans, French, Italians, and other women of continental Europe are never guilty of similar vulgarity and among Americans it is absolutely unknown. It is customary for everybody to dress for dinner, and while the practice has serious objections in stormy weather, it is entirely permissible and comfortable during the long, warm nights on the Indian Ocean. The weather, however, was not nearly as warm as we expected to find it. We were four days on the Red Sea and six days on the Indian Ocean, and were entirely comfortable, except for two days, when the wind was so strong and kicked up so much water that the portholes had to be closed, and it was very close and stuffy in the cabin. While the sun was hot, there was always a cool breeze from one direction or another, and the captain told me it was customary during the winter season. The passengers in our steamer were mostly English, with a few East Indians and Americans. You cannot board a steamer in any part of the world nowadays without finding some of your fellow countrymen. They are becoming the greatest travelers of any nation, and are penetrating to uttermost parts of the earth. Many of the English passengers were army officers returning to India from furloughs or going out for service, and officers' families who had been spending the hot months in England. We had lots of lords and sirs and lady dowagers, 
generals, colonels, and officers of lesser rank, and the usual number of brides and bridegrooms, on their wedding tours. Others were officials of the government in India, who had been home to be married. And we had several young women who were going out to be married. Their lovers were not able to leave their business to make the long voyage, and were waiting for them in Bombay, Calcutta, or in some of the other cities. But perhaps the largest contingent were civil servants, as employees of the government are called, who had been home on leave. The climate of India is very trying to white people, and, recognizing that fact, the government gives its officials six months' leave with full pay, or twelve months' leave with half pay every five years. In that way, an official who has served five consecutive years in India can spend the sixth year in England or anywhere else he likes. We had several notable natives, including Judge Nair, a judicial magistrate at Madras, who has gained eminence at the Indian bar and was received with honors in England. He is a Parsi, a member of that remarkable race which is descended from the Persian fire worshippers. He dresses and talks and acts exactly like an ordinary English barrister. There were three brothers in the attractive native dress, Mohammedans, sons of Adamji Pirboy, one of the largest cotton manufacturers and wealthiest men in India, who employs more than 15,000 operatives in his mills and furnished the canvas for the tents and the khaki for the uniforms of the British soldiers during the South African War. These young gentlemen had been making a tour of Europe, combining business with pleasure, and had inspected nearly all the great cotton mills in England and on the continent, picking up points for their own improvement. They are intelligent and enterprising men, and their reputation for integrity, ability, and loyalty to the British government has frequently been recognized in a conspicuous manner. Our most notable shipmate was the Right Honourable Lord Lamington, recently governor of one of the Australian provinces, on his way to assume similar responsibility at Bombay, which is considered a more responsible post. He is a youngish-looking, handsome man, and might easily be mistaken for Governor Myron T. Herrick of Ohio. One night at dinner his lordship was toasted by an Indian prince we had on board, and made a pleasant reply, although it was plain to see that he was not an orator. Captain Preston, the commander of the ship, who was afterward called upon, made a much more brilliant speech. The prince was Ranit Senji, a famous cricket player, whom some considered the champion in that line of sport. He went over to the United States with an English team, and will be pleasantly remembered at all the places he visited. He is a handsome fellow, twenty-five years old, about the color of a mulatto, with a slender athletic figure, graceful manners, a pleasant smile, and a romantic history. His father was ruler of one of the native states, and, dying, left his throne, title, and estates to his eldest son. The latter, being many years older than Ranjit Sinji, adopted him as his heir, and sent him to England to be educated for the important duty he was destined to perform. He went through the school at Harrow and Cambridge University, and took honors in scholarship as well as athletics, and was about to return to assume his hereditary responsibility in, in India when, to the astonishment of all concerned, a boy baby was born in his brother's harem, the first and only child of a rajah, seventy-eight years of age. The mother was a Mohammedan woman, and, according to a strict construction of the laws governing such things among the Hindus, the child was not entitled to any consideration whatever. Without going into details, it is sufficient for the story to say that the public at large did not believe that the old Raja was the father of the child, or that the infant was entitled to succeed him, even if he had been. But the old man was so pleased at the birth of the baby that he immediately proclaimed him his heir. The act was confirmed by Lord Elgin, the viceroy, and the honors and estates which Ranit Sinji expected to inherit vanished like a dream. The old man gave him an allowance of ten thousand dollars a year, and he has since lived in London consoling himself with cricket. Another distinguished passenger was Sir Kawashi Jahangir Redimani, 
an Indian baronet, who inherited immense wealth from a long line of Parsi bankers. They have adopted as a sort of trademark a nickname given by some wag to the founder of the family in the last century because of his immense fortune and success in trade. Mr. Ready Money, or Sir Jehangir, as he is commonly known, the present head of the house, was accompanied by his wife, two daughters, their governess, and his son, who had been spending several months in London, where he had been the object of much gratifying attention. His father received his title as an acknowledgment of his generosity in presenting two hundred fifty thousand dollars to the Indian Institute in London, and for other public benefactions, estimated at one million three hundred thousand dollars. He built colleges, hospitals, insane asylums, and other institutions. He founded a stranger's home at Bombay for the refuge of people of respectability who find themselves destitute or friendless or become ill in that city. He erected drinking fountains of artistic architecture at several convenient places in Bombay and gave enormous sums to various charities in London and elsewhere without respect to race or creed. Both the Roman Catholic and the Presbyterian missions in India have been the recipients of large gifts, and the university at Bombay owes him for its finest building. Several of the most prominent native families in India have followed the example of Mr. Ready Money by adopting the nicknames that were given their ancestors. Indian names are difficult to pronounce. What, for example, would you call Mr. Jamshildi? or Mr. Jibahai, and those are comparatively simple. Hence, in early times it was the habit of foreigners to call the natives with whom they came in contact by names that were appropriate to their character or their business. For example, Mr. Reporter, one of the editors of the Times of India, as his father was before him, is known honorably by a name given by people who were unable to pronounce his father's Indian name. Sir Jamsij Ed Jijiboy, one of the most prominent and wealthy Parsis, who is known all over India for his integrity and enterprise, and has given millions of dollars to colleges, schools, hospitals, asylums, and other charities, is commonly known as Mr. Bottle Waller. Waller is the native word for trader, and his grandfather was engaged in selling and manufacturing bottles. He began by picking up empty soda and brandy bottles about the saloons, clubs, and hotels, and in that humble way laid the foundation of an immense fortune and a reputation that any man might envy. The family have always signed their letters and checks Bottle Waller, and have been known by that name in business and society. But when Queen Victoria made the grandfather a baronet, because of his distinguished services, the title was conferred upon James Judd Gigi Boy, which was his lawful name. Another similar case is that of the Petit family, one of the richest in India, and the owners and occupants of the finest palaces in Bombay. Their ancestor, or the first of the family who distinguished himself, was a man of very small stature, almost a dwarf, who was known as Le Petit. He accepted the christening and bore the name honorably, as his sons and grandsons have since done. They are now baronets, but have never dropped it, and the present head of the house is Sir Manakji Petit. The Eye of India, as Bombay is called, sits on an island facing the Arabian Sea on one side, and a large bay on the other, but the water is quite shallow, except where channels have been dredged to the docks. The scenery is not attractive. Low hills rise in a semicircle from the horizon, half concealed by a curtain of mist, and a few green islands, scattered about promiscuously, are occupied by hospitals, military barracks, villas, and plantations. Nor is the harbor impressive. It is not worth description, but the pile of buildings which rises on the city side as the steamer approaches its dock is imposing, being a picturesque mingling of Oriental and European architecture. Indeed, I do not know of any city that presents a braver front to those who arrive by sea. At the upper end, which you see first, is a group of five-story apartment houses, with oriental balconies and colonnades. Then comes a monstrous new hotel, built by a stock company under the direction of the late J. N. Tata, 
a Parsi merchant who visited the United States several times and obtained his inspirations and many of his ideas there. Beside the hotel rise the buildings of the Yacht Club, a hospitable association of Englishmen, to which natives, no matter how great and good they may be, are never admitted. Connected with the club is an apartment house for gentlemen, and so hospitable are the members that a traveler can secure quarters there without difficulty if he brings a letter of introduction. Next toward the docks is an old castle whose gray and lichen-covered walls are a striking contrast to the new modern buildings that surround it. These walls enclose a considerable area, which by courtesy is called a fort. It was a formidable defense at one time, and has been the scene of much exciting history, but is obsolete now. The walls are of heavy masonry, but a shot from a modern gun would shatter them. They enclose the military headquarters of the Bombay province, or presidency, as it is called in the Indian gazetteer, the cathedral of this diocese, quarters and barracks for the garrison, an arsenal, magazines and other military buildings, and a palatial sailor's home, one of the finest and largest institution of this kind in the world, which is supported by contributions from the various shipping companies that patronize this place. There are also several machine shops, factories, and warehouses which contain vast stores of war material of every sort, sufficient to equip an army at a fortnight's notice. About twelve hundred men are constantly employed in the arsenal and shops making and repairing military arms and equipments. There is a museum of ancient weapons, and many which were captured from the natives in the early days of India's occupation are quite curious, and there the visitor will have his first view of one of the greatest wonders of nature, a banyan tree, which drops its branches to take root in the soil beneath its overspreading boughs. But you must wait until you get to Calcutta before you can see the best specimens. Bombay is not fortified, except by a few guns behind some earthworks at the entrance of the harbor. But it must be if the Russians secure a port upon the Arabian Sea, not only Bombay, but the entire west coast of India. The only protection for the city now is a small fleet of battleships, monitors, and gunboats that lie in the harbor, and there are usually several visiting men of war at the anchorage. Bombay is the second city in population in India. Calcutta standing first on the list with 1,350,000 people. And if you will take your map for a moment, you will see that the two cities lie in almost the same latitude, one on each side of the monstrous peninsula, Bombay at the top of the Arabian Sea and Calcutta at the top of the Bay of Bengal. By the census of 1891, Bombay had 821,764 population. By the census of 1901, the total was 776,006 people, the decrease of 45,758 being attributed to the frightful mortality by the plague in 1900 and 1901. It is the most enterprising, the most modern, the most active, the richest and most prosperous city in India. More than 90% of the travelers who enter and leave the country pass over the docks and more than half the foreign commerce of the country goes through its custom house. It is by all odds the finest city between modern Cairo and San Francisco, and its commercial and industrial interests exceed that of any other. The arrangements for landing passengers are admirable. On the ship all our baggage was marked with numbers corresponding to that of our declaration to the collector of customs. The steamer anchored out about a quarter of a mile from a fine-covered pier. We were detained on board until the baggage, even our small pieces, was taken ashore on one launch, and after a while we followed it on another. Upon reaching the dock we passed up a long aisle to where several deputy collectors were seated behind desks. As we gave our names, they looked through the bundles of declarations which had been arranged alphabetically, and, finding the proper one, told us that we would have to pay a duty of five per cent upon our typewriter and kodaks, and that a receipt and certificate would be furnished by which 
we could recover the money at any port by which we left India. Nothing else was taxed, although I noticed that nearly every passenger had to pay on something else. There is only one rate of duty, 5% ad valorem upon everything. Jewelry, furniture, machinery, all pay the same, which simplified the transaction. But the importation of arms and ammunition is strictly prohibited, and every gun, pistol, and cartridge is confiscated in the custom-house, unless the owner can present evidence that he is an officer of the army or navy, and that they are the tools of his trade, or has a permit issued by the proper authority. This precaution is intended to anticipate any conspiracy similar to that which led to the great mutiny of 1857. The natives are not allowed to carry guns or even to own them, and every gun or other weapon found in the hands of a Hindu is confiscated unless he has a permit. And as an additional precaution, the rifles issued to the native regiments in the army have a range of only 1,200 yards, while those issued to the white regiments will kill at 1,600 yards, thus giving the latter an important advantage in case of an insurrection. After having interviewed the deputy collector, we were admitted to a great pen or corral in the middle of the pier, which is enclosed by a high fence, and there found all our luggage piled up together on a bench. And all the trunks and bags and baskets from the ship were similarly assorted, according to the numbers they bore. We were not asked to open anything. None of our packages were examined the declarations of passengers usually being accepted as truthful and final unless the inspectors have reason to believe or suspect deception. Gangs of coolies in livery, each wearing a brass tag with his number, stood by ready to seize the baggage and carry it to the hotel wagons, which stood outside, where we followed it and, directed by a polite sick policeman, took the first carriage in line. Everything was conducted in a most orderly manner. There was no confusion, no jostling, and no excitement, which indicates that the Bombay officials have correct notions of what is proper and carry them into practice. The docks of Bombay are the finest in Asia, and when the extensions now in progress are carried out, few cities in Europe can surpass them. They are planned for a century in advance. The people of Bombay are not boastful but they are confident of the growth of their city and its commerce. Attached to the docks is a story of integrity and fidelity worth telling. In 1735, the municipal authorities of the young city, anticipating commercial prosperity, decided to improve their harbor and build piers for the accommodation of vessels, but nobody around the place had experience in such matters, and a commission was sent off to other cities of India to find a man to take charge. The commission was very much pleased with the appearance and ability of Loji Nasharanji, the Parsi foreman of the harbor at the neighboring town of Surat, and tried to coax him away by making a very lucrative offer, much in advance of the pay he was then receiving. He was too loyal and honest to accept it, and read the commission a lecture on business integrity which greatly impressed them. When they returned to Bombay and related their experience, the municipal authorities communicated with those of Surat and enclosed an invitation to Nasherwanji to come down and build a dock for Bombay. The offer was so advantageous that his employers advised him to accept it. He did so and from that day to this, a man of his name, and one of his descendants, has been superintendent of the docks of this city. The office has practically become hereditary in the family. A decided sensation awaits the traveler when he passes out from the pier to, into the street, particularly if it is his first visit to the east. He already has had a glimpse of the gorgeous costumes of the Hindu gentlemen and the priestly-looking Parsees, and the long, cool white robes of the common people, for several of each class were gathered at the end of the pier to welcome friends who arrived by the steamer. But the moment that he emerges from the dock, he enters a new and strange world, filled with vivid colors and fantastic costumes. He sees his first Gary, a queer-looking vehicle made of bamboo, painted in odd patterns and bright tints, and drawn by a cow or a bullock. 
that will trot almost as fast as a horse. All vehicles, however, are now called gharis in India, no matter where they come from nor how they are built. The chariot of the viceroy as well as the little donkey cart of the native fruit peddler. The extent of bare flesh visible, masculine and feminine, startles you at first, and the scanty apparel worn by the common people of both sexes. Working women walk by with their legs bare from the thighs down, wearing nothing but a single garment wrapped in graceful folds around their slender bodies. They look very small compared with the men, and the first question every stranger asks is the reason. You are told that they are married in infancy, that they begin to bear children by the time they are twelve and fourteen years old, and consequently do not have time to grow, and perhaps that is the correct explanation for the diminutive stature of the women of India. There are exceptions. You see a few stalwart Amazons, but ninety percent or more of the sex are undersize. Perhaps there is another reason which does not apply to the upper classes, and that is the manual labor the coolies women perform, the loads they carry on their heads, and the heavy lifting that is required of them. If you approach a building in course of erection, you will find that the stone, brick, mortar, and other material is carried up the ladders and across the scaffolding on the heads of women and girls, and some of these hod carriers are not more than ten or twelve years old. They carry everything on their heads, and usually it requires two other women or girls to hoist the heavy burden to the head of the third. All the weight comes on the spine, and must necessarily prevent or retard growth, although it gives them an erect and stately carriage, which women in America might imitate with profit. At the same time, perhaps, our women might prefer to acquire their carriage in some other way than toting a hodful of bricks to the top of a four-story building. The second thing that impresses you is the amount of glistening silver the working women wear upon their naked limbs. To drop into poetry, like Silas Wegg, they wear rings in their noses and rings on their toeses and bands of silver wherever they can fasten them on their arms and legs and neck. They have bracelets, anklets, armlets, necklaces, and their noses as well as their ears are pierced for pendants. You wonder how a woman can eat, drink, or sleep with a great big ornament hanging over her lips, and some of the earrings must weigh several ounces, for they fall almost to the shoulders. You will meet a dozen coolie women every block with two or three pounds of silver ornaments distributed over their persons, which represent their savings bank, for every spare rupee is invested in a ring, bracelet, or a necklace, which, of course, does not pay interest, but can be disposed of for full value in case of an emergency. The workmanship is crude, but the designs are often pretty, and a collection of the silver ornaments worn by Hindu women would make an interesting exhibit for a museum. They are often a burden to them, particularly in hot weather, when they chafe and burn the flesh, and our Bombay friends tell us that in the summer the fountain basins, the hydrants, and every other place where water can be found will be surrounded by women bathing the spots where the silver ornaments have seared the skin and cooling the metal, which is often so hot as to burn the fingers. Another feature of Bombay life which immediately seizes the attention is the gay colors worn by everybody, which makes the streets look like animated rainbows or the kaleidoscopes that you can buy at the ten cent stores. Orange and scarlet predominate, but yellow, pink, purple, green, blue, and every other tent that was ever invented appears in the robes of the Hindus you meet upon the street. A dignified old gentleman will cross your path with a pink turban on his head and a green scarf wound around his shoulders. The next man you meet may have a pair of scarlet stockings, a purple robe, and a tunic of wine-colored velvet embroidered in gold. There seems to be no rule or regulation about the use of colors and no set fashion for raiment. The only uniformity in the costume worn by the men of India is that everybody's legs are bare. Most men wear sandals, some wear shoes, but trousers are as rare as stovepipe hats. The native merchant goes to his counting room, the banker to his desk, the clergyman discourses from a pulpit, the lawyer addresses the court, the professor expounds to his students, and the coolie carries his load, all with limbs naked from the ankles to the thighs, and never more than half concealed by a muslin-divided skirt. 
The race, the caste, and often the province of a resident of India may be determined by his headgear. The Parsis wear tall fly-trap hats made of horsehair, with a top like a cow's foot. The Mohammedans wear the fez, and the Hindus the turban, and there are infinite varieties of turbans, both in the material used and in the manner in which they are put up. An old resident of India can usually tell where a man comes from by looking at his turban. End of The Eye of India The Lions of Scotland From The Continental Monthly Volume 4, Number 5, November 1863 By Anonymous British and American Periodical Articles, 1852-1905 to By Various Section 3 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times The restoration mania which now pervades Great Britain, however much it be declaimed against by certain hypercritical architects, is yet certain to have at least one favorable result in preserving to the future tourist the noble monuments of the past. The abbeys and castles and tombs of England and Scotland are now so well cared for that, Ruins, though they may be, they will last for centuries. And yet the observant traveler can note, year by year, little changes, trifling alterations, which, though without great importance, are not destitute of interest. For he who has once visited Melrose will be interested to learn that even one more stone has fallen from the ruin. It is intended, in the following pages, to review the present condition and state the recent changes in the Lions of Scotland, and particularly in the localities with which the memories of Burns and Scott, memories so dear, both to the untraveled and traveled American, are most closely associated. Of the thousands of visitors who yearly flock to do mental homage at the tomb of Shakespeare, one out of every ten is from the United States and so large a minority of tourists in Scotland, and particularly of those most deeply interested in Scotland's greatest bards, hail from the New World. The conclusion of the war will probably be the signal for an unusual hegira from America to Europe, and these notes of the actual condition in A.D. 1863 of Scotland's famed shrines may serve to whet the increasing appetite for foreign travel. Bobby Burns is buried at Dumfries, a rather dull town, which, fortunately for the tourists, has no notable church or ruin to be visited, Nolens Volens. The place has, however, a continental air, caused principally by the very curious clock tower in the marketplace, a quaint spire in the background, adding to the effect of the architectural picture. At one end of the town is St. Michael's Church a huge square box, pierced by windows and guarded by a big sentinel of a bell-tower, surmounted by another quaint spire. The graveyard is one of the oddest in the kingdom, presenting long rows of huge tombstones, twelve or fifteen feet high, usually painted of a muddy cream color, each one serving for an entire family, and recording the trades of professions as well as the names and ages of the deceased. One of these enormous stones is in commemoration of the victims of the cholera in 1832. In one corner of the cemetery is the tasteless mausoleum of Burns, a circular Grecian temple, the spaces between the pillars glazed, and a low dome, shaped like an inverted washbowl, clapped on top. The interior is occupied by Turnerelli's fine marble group of Burns at the plough, interrupted by the muse of poetry. At the foot of this group, and covering the poet's remains, is the freshly painted slab bearing these inscriptions. In memory of Robert Burns, who died the 21st of July, 1796, in the 37th year of his age. And Maxwell Burns, who died the 25th April, 1799, aged two years and nine months. Francis Wallace Burns, who died the 9th July, 1803 aged fourteen years, his sons. The remains of Burns removed into the vault below, 19th September, 1815, and his two sons. Also the remains of 
Jean Amour, relict of the poet, born 6th February 1765, died 26 March 1834, and Robert, his eldest son, died May 14, 1857, aged 70 years. Visitors are allowed to enter the cheerful, if not elegant, mausoleum, though all it contains can be seen through the windows. All the memorials of Burns, by the way, seem to be of the same tasteless style, the same wearisome imitation of the antique. The monument of at Ayr and that on Calton Hill, Edinburgh, are but additional examples. Before leaving Dumfries, let me allude to a very curious custom observed only in St. Michael's Church, and even there beginning to fall into desertude. The Scotch, who are alike noted for snuff and religious austerity, are equally devoted to footstools. In many families, where economy is the rule, one footstool, they are mere little wooden benches, serves both for the fireside and the kirk. To facilitate transportation, these benches are provided with little holes perforating the center of the seat, large enough to admit the ferrule of an umbrella or cane, and thus, borne aloft on these articles, the little benches are carried proudly above the shoulders of the bearers, like triumphant banners. In order to avoid the noise arising from the clatter of these benches, as they are lowered into the pews, the congregation are accustomed to assemble some time before divine service begins. A similar custom once prevailed in the cathedral at Glasgow. In 1588, the Kirk Session decided that seats in the church would be a great luxury, and certain ash trees in the churchyard were cut down and devoted to the then novel purpose. But, ungallantly enough, the women of the congregation were forbidden to sit on the new seats, and were ordered to bring stools along with them. Tradition, however, fails to record whether the Glasgow ladies carried their stools on the tops of umbrellas like their sisters of Dumfries. The grave of Burns owes to its uncouth monument the unsatisfactory feeling which it inspires in visitors. Alloway Kirk is the place where the remains of the favorite Scottish poet should lie, instead of artificial temples, badly copied from a clime and nation with which he had no sympathy or affinity. The young daisy and the fresh grass should mark his resting place. Alloway's Kirk Haunted Wall is preserved with such faithful care that this year it looks very much the same as it did when Burns knew it. As a ruin, apart from the interest with which the poet has invested it, it possesses nothing to attract attention. Two end walls, which once supported a gable roof, and two low side walls, all without ornament of any kind, without Gothic tracing or oriel wonders, without even graceful ivy flung over its ruggedness, are all that remain of Alloway, if we accept the old bell, which yet hangs in the little belfry, a signboard below insulting visitors by requesting them not to throw stones at it. The little churchyard of Alloway continues to be a burial place, but the gravestones seem, in many instances, sadly inconsistent with the poetical associations of the place. As at Dumfries, the business occupations of the deceased are mentioned, and we find here the family tombs of Robert Anderson, Mole Catcher, of James Wallace, Blacksmith, and the like. David Watt Miller, who was buried here in 1823, was the last person baptized in the old Alloway Kirk, his tombstone recording the fact. Near the entrance to the graveyard, and opposite the new Gothic edifice, which has taken the place of the old Kirk, is the slab to the poet's father and sister, thus inscribed. Sacred to the memory of William Burns, farmer in Lockie, who died in February 13, 1784, in the sixty-third year of his age. Also of Isabella, relict of John Bell, his youngest daughter, born at Mount Oliphant, June 27, 1771, died December 4, 1858, much respected and esteemed by a wide circle of friends, to whom she endeared herself by her life of piety, her mild urbanity of manner, and her devotion to the memory of Burns. The reader is aware that Alloway's Kirk 
the Burns Monument, the cottage where the poet was born, the elaborate temple erected to his memory, and Tam O'Shanter's brig are all within a few rods of each other, at about two miles' distance from air. The view of the temple, kirk, and brig, from the opposite side of the stream, is worthy of Arcadia. The temple is familiar from engravings, but the bridge, with its graceful arch, draped by low-hanging ivy, is far more beautiful. Yet this exquisite scene is identified with one of Burns' coarsest efforts, for which, with all its vividness and humor, cannot be read aloud in the family circle. Fortunately, however, for the poet, his fame by no means rests on this unequal mixture of the humorous, the beautiful, and the vulgar and instead of admiring tam o'shanter's bridge itself it is much more pleasant to stand upon it and gaze therefrom at the river which laves the banks and braes of obanis dun at the fields besprinkled with the wee crimson tipped flower at the cottages where once lived the old acquaintance of lang syne and where occurred the scenes of the cotter's saturday night highland mary has crossed this bridge, and this sanctifies it far more than the imaginary terrors of Tam O'Shanter. An hour's railway ride takes the tourist from the land of Burns to the scenes rendered sacred by the genius of Scott. Abbotsford, the favorite home, of course is still open to visitors, who are hurried through it with the most disgusting celerity by the guide engaged by the family to do, at a shilling a head, the hospitalities of the place. The home of Scott retains all it, the characteristics it did when he died, but is shown in such a heartless, museum-like manner that the visitor need not expect much gratification from the inspection. A few miles farther up the Tweed is Ashtiel, the former home of Walter Scott, a place seldom seen by tourists, though here he wrote his finest poems. Some time ago I was invited to spend a night with a farmer, who resides on the estate. Those who have read Washington Irving's graphic description of his visit to Abbotsford will remember Mr. Laidlaw, of whom he thus writes. One of my pleasant rambles with Scott about the neighborhood of Abbotsford was taken in company with Mr. William Laidlaw, the steward of his estate. This was a gentleman for whom Scott entertained a particular value, he had been born to a competency, had been well educated, his mind was richly stored with varied information, and he was a man of sterling moral worth. Having been reduced by misfortune, Scott had got him to take charge of his estate. He lived at a small farm on the hillside above Abbotsford, and was treated by Scott as a cherished and confidential friend, rather than a dependent. My worthy host was the son of this old gentleman, who is still alive and in good health. Several years ago he emigrated to Australia, where he now resides, still taking a lively interest in literary affairs, and reading, though an octogenarian, all the new works that are regularly sent to him by his son. The old gentleman was as intimately acquainted with Hogg as with Scott, and my host remembers both these personages, though he was but a boy when they died. Early one September morning, Mr. Laidlaw was kind enough to take me about the grounds of Ashtiel, where Sir Walter, they never added the name of Scott in speaking of him here, passed thirteen of the best years of his life, and where he wrote the greater parts of Marmion and the Lay. We walked over the dewy fields, romantic but damp, and down to the banks of the Tweed, where I was shown a large outspreading oak under which Sir Walter was wont to sit and frame his ideas into fitting words. Under this tree, with Tweed rippling at his feet, he spent many an hour in communion with himself, quietly weaving those strains that have immortalized him. From this place we passed on to the house itself, Ashtiel, now the residence of Sir William Johnston, from whose family Sir Walter had leased it during the building of Abbotsford. It is a fine old building, but much altered and improved since it was occupied by Scott. Lockhart says of this place, No more beautiful situation for the residence of a poet could be imagined. The house was then a small one, 
but compared with the cottage of Lasswade, its accommodations were amply sufficient. The approach was through an old-fashioned garden with holly hedges and broad green terrace walks. On one side, close under the windows, is a deep ravine, clothed with venerable trees, down which a mountain rivulet is heard, more than seen, on its progress to the Tweed. The river itself is separated from the high bank on which the house stands, only by a narrow meadow of the richest verdure, while opposite and all around are the green hills. The valley there is narrow, and the aspect in every direction is that of perfect pastoral repose. This picture still holds good, with the exception of the old-fashioned garden, which has made way for a new lawn and carriage road. The proprietor was an intimate friend of Walter Scott, and an India officer of merit, who has now returned to his old home, having bidden farewell to the neighing steed and all the pomp and circumstance of war. From the house I was conducted to another of Scott's haunts, a little wooded grassy knoll, still known by the name of Waddy's Knoll, or Sheriff's Knoll, for Scott enjoyed both the familiar title of Waddy and the official one of Sheriff. It is a lovely spot, this Waddy's Knoll. The trees are old and gnarled, the grass is overrun with green moss and graceful fern leaves, and if you are quite still, you can hear the murmur of Glenkinnon Burn as it leaps over its pebbly bed and hastens on to the tweed. Here, between the branching trunks of a huge elm, Scott had fixed a rustic seat, to which he resorted nearly as often as to his favorite oak tree on the banks of the tweed. While he resided here, Abbotsford was building, and almost daily he would ride over to superintend its progress. Melrose is this year guarded with unusual vigilance. Hitherto, visitors have been allowed to pass hours in the ruin at their leisure, and read the wizard scene of the lay of the last minstrel, in the very locality where it is supposed to have occurred. At present, however, a sable widow, of the most unimpeachable respectability, casts a melancholy gloom over the place by the dejected yet resigned manner in which she unlocks the wooden gate and ushers strangers through the nave and transepts. Her orders, she says, are to allow no one to remain a moment in the ruin without her superintending presence, which is safe but unpoetical. Dryburg the ruin in which is the tomb of Walter Scott is shown by an intelligent man who oversees the place. At the foot of Sir Walter's granite tomb is that recently erected to the memory of the son-in-law, biographer, and friend, Lockhart. A bronze medallion likeness of the eminent reviewer adorns the red-polished granite of his tomb. The Erskine family, the Hags of Bemerside, and the Earls of Buchan, are the only families, besides Sir Walter's ancestors, the Halliburtons, who are allowed to bury in this ruin. It was of the Hagues that Thomas the Rhymer, centuries ago, made a prediction to the effect that the line would never become extinct, a prediction which threatens to fail, as two maiden ladies now alone represent the family. The Proud Chapelle, where Rosalind's chiefs uncoffined lie, has seen some notable changes of late. A few years ago it contained only tombs, but the present Earl of Roslyn recently fitted it up for a divine service, according to the Church of England ritual, through the altar, though the altar, the sedilla, the candles, the purple cloths, the painted organ, and other ecclesiastical decorations suggest an imitation of the Roman Catholic services to which the chapel was formerly devoted. The people in the vicinity, who are all Scotch Presbyterians, do not attend these services, the select congregation being formed by the quality, the gentry and nobility, who have their country seats nearby. The readers of Marmion will, of course, remember Norham and Twizzle castles. The former, as seen from the railways, is a most uninviting pile of rude masonry, worn and broken by time and decay but a nearer inspection reveals many phases of interest. The castle stands on the summit of a cliff overhanging the Tweed, yet almost buried in rich foliage. 
The outer walls are crumbled away and overgrown with short grass, forming a series of green mounds which mark the graves of feudal grandeur. The south, east, and west walls of the keep, however, remain standing, a huge shell or screen of dull red stone, while to the north stretches a fragment of wall, along which it is easy to scramble to a point overlooking the Tweed, the village of Norham, and the adjacent scenery. Pleasant and thrilling it is to lie here on this deserted ruin and read that spirited opening canto. With what renewed brilliancy do those chivalric lines bring back the long-past scenes of other days? Days set on Norham's castle steep, and Tweed's fair river broad and deep, and Cheviot's mountains lone, the battle towers, the donjon keep, the loophole grates where captives weep, the flanking walls that round them sweep in yellow luster shone. An imagination can almost bring to the ear the welcome to Marmion. The guards their morris pikes advanced, the trumpets flourish brave, the cannon from the ramparts glanced, and thundering welcome gave. A blithe salute in martial sort the minstrels well might sound, for as Lord Marmion crossed the court, he scattered angels round. Welcome to Norham, Marmion, stout heart and noble hand, well dost thou back thy gallant roan, thou flower of English land. They marshalled him to the castle hall, where the guests stood all aside, and loudly flourished the trumpet call, and the heralds loudly cried, Room, lordlings, room for Lord Marmion, with crest and helm of gold. Full well we know the trophies won, in the lists at Cottiswold. Places nobles for the falcon knight, Room, room, ye gentles gay, For him who conquered in the night, Marmion of Fontenay. Scott is already becoming old-fashioned, and his poems are not now sought after, as they were ten years ago, but any one who wishes to revive all the boyish enthusiasm with which he first read Marmion has only to take the book with him to the ruins of Norham, and again read the glowing page. The village of Norham is a quaint place dominated by the castle, and is humble nowadays, with its little thatched cottages, as in the times when the villagers were mere vassals of Sir Hugh the Heron Bold, Baron of Twizzle and of Ford, and Captain of the Hold. A limpid stream runs down the principal street of Norham, a gutter which in the sunlight gleams like a band of silver. Village damsels wash potatoes therein. Among the residents of Norham, by the way, is the hostess of the principal inn, who was in the train of Joseph Bonaparte during his stay in America, living in his household at Bordentown, New Jersey. She claims to be a personal acquaintance of Napoleon III, but I have not heard what strange wave of fortune stranded the friend of the Emperor of the French in the remote and unknown part of Norham. A curious family romance hangs about Twizzle Castle, also mentioned in Marmion. The present building, an immense quadrangular edifice, was begun by Sir Francis Drake, who never had means to finish it. His heirs tried to complete the castle, which is now the property of a lady over seventy years old, residing in Edinburgh, who devotes all her spare means to the work. Indeed, the building of Twizzle Castle is a hereditary monomania in the family, but the estate belonging to the magnificent structure is only forty acres in extent, utterly insufficient to support such a castle with the household it will ultimately need. As yet, Twizzle is a granite shell. No partitions are put up in the interior. Vast sums of money must be expended before it can be made tenantable. But I must forego any allusions to Crichton and Pantalon castles, the former the place where Marmion was entertained, and the latter the spot where the bold chief dared to beard the lion in his den, the Douglas in his hall. And I must also omit Newark's stately tower, where the last minstrel sang his lay, and Branksome, the scene of the opening canto, and the scenery of Lomond and Katrine, rendered famous by the success of the Lady of the Lake. All these, and many other localities, hallowed by poesy, can be easily visited by the enthusiastic tourist, but I prefer to devote my pen and space to the most neglected and most beautiful of them all, to Linda's farm, the Holy Isle. 
though really in England it is yet near enough to the border to be included among the lions of Scotland. It lies on the coast about a dozen miles south of Berwick-upon-Tweed, the nearest approach to it, being from the railway station of Beale. Here the visitor will find the one-horse cart of the postmaster, offering the only conveyance to one of the most romantic and retired spots in the kingdom. Holy Island, in circumference about eight miles, lies three miles from the land, but is only an island at high tide. At other times the receding waters leave the sands bare, with the exception of two or three channels not more than six inches deep, and afford a passage for vehicles marked by a long row of stakes, intended especially to guide travelers in winter, when the snow falls thickly on the path. In summer there is always a strong wind blowing over these sands, drying them from the salt water, forming picturesque patterns along the ever-changing ground, and dashing a thin veil of sand along the way. Woe to the unlucky white who loses his hat in this place! With nothing to intercept it, the unfortunate headgear is at once taken by the wind and sent flying over the sand plain, faster than human foot can run, far out to the island, and often over it to the sea beyond. The frolicsome dog, which generally accompanies the postmaster's cart, is the only hope on which the hatless wretch can then rely, and usually this reliance is not in vain. Holy Island contains a population of some six hundred souls, mostly fishermen. Not a tree grows on the island, but at the south end, where a low village crouches down against the continual sweepings of the stormy winds, are a few fields, fragrant with clover, and gleaming with buttercups. And in one of these fields, scarce a stone's throw from the beating surf, stand the ruins of Lindisfarne Abbey, one of the earliest seats of Christianity in Great Britain, and one closely identified with the traditionary career of St. Cuthbert. The front walls, portions of the side walls, a diagonal arch richly ornamented, and the chancel, recently repaired to arrest further decay, remain to tell of its former beauty. The area within the ruins is strewn with seashells and pebbles, while about the bases, whence once sprang aloft the clustered pillars of the nave, grow in rich profusion hardy yellow flowers. The sharp sea winds have eaten into the stone in many places, reducing it to an apparent honeycomb. No ripple of gentle streamlet falls on the ear, no luxuriant foliage offers its pleasant shade, no ivy drapery, stirred by the summer breeze, floats from the decaying walls. But instead of these gentle attractions which Tenter and Bolton and Valley Crucis offer, we have at Lindisfarne the boom of the ocean surf and the biting freshness of the keen sea wind. Scott thus describes Holy Island and Lindisfarne. The tide did now its flood mark gain, and girdled in the saint's domain, for with the flow and ebb its style varied from continent to isle. Dryshod o'er sands twice every day, the pilgrims to the shrine find way. Twice every day the waves efface, of staves and sandaled feet the trace. As to the port the galley flew, higher and higher rose to view, the castle with its battled walls, the ancient monastery's halls, a solemn, huge, and dark red pile, placed on the margin of the isle. In Saxon strength that abbey frowned, with massive arches broad and round, that rose alternate, row on row, on ponderous columns short and low. Built ere the art was known, by pointed aisle and shafted stock, the arcades of alleyed walk to emulate in stone. The scenes of Sarrow and Ettrick Vales, associated with the life and described in the poetry of the Ettrick Shepherd, deserve more attention from tourists than they usually receive. The single tomb in Ettrick Kirkyard, the site of his birthplace nearby, marked by a stone in the wall bearing the letters J. H. Poet. Chapel Hope, the scene of the Brownie of Bodsbeck, Sweet St. Mary's Lake, Mount Benger, and the new monument recently erected on the shores of St. Mary's, representing the poet seated on a rock, his plaid thrown loosely over his shoulders, and his shepherd's dog by his side. All these localities cannot fail to interest those who know James Hogg, either by his works or by his character, 
so powerfully and singularly delineated in the pages of Noctis Ambrosiana. Burns the Plowman, Scott the Minstrel, Hogg the Shepherd, how much does Scotland owe to the magic of their pens? Without them, her mountains and lakes and streams would never have known the presence of that indefatigable, money-spending feature of modern life, the tourist, for without them, few indeed would be the Lions of Scotland. End of Section 3 The Lions of Scotland by Anonymous The Colored People at the New Orleans Exposition From The American Missionary, Volume 39, Number 7, July 1885 by Anonymous British and American Periodical Articles 1852 to 1905 by various section 4 this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by bologna times the colored people of the united states are just 20 years out of the house of bondage with long centuries of barbarism and 250 years of slavery behind them they started out homeless landless moneyless and experienceless the New Orleans Exposition was to have exhibits from all lands, Asia with its millennium of transmitted achievements, Europe with its centuries of enlightened development, the United States with their wonderful improvements on the best the world had produced, were all to be there. What show could the twenty-year-old freedmen make in such company? The very idea of their attempting to put in an appearance would seem absurd. But the colored people desired at least to stand up and be counted. They determined to be there. The entire gallery in one end of the immense government building was assigned them, and the specimens of their skill more than filled it. They came from nearly every state and territory in the Union. Their exhibits represented almost every department of mechanical, agricultural, and artistic skill. Excellence in workmanship fertility in invention, tastefulness in the fine arts, were all displayed to a remarkable degree in the large collection. Southerners and Northerners were alike astonished at what their eyes beheld. Those who thought that the Negro has no higher mission than to be a hewer of wood and drawer of water, were compelled either to change their minds, or else say they did not believe that the colored people did the work. It was amusing to hear the remarks of some of the latter class as they looked at some beautiful specimens of Negro handicraft or ingenuity. It may interest the readers of the missionary to glance at the great variety of lines along which Negro ability put itself on exhibition. Examination papers from schools were very numerous, showing proficiency in penmanship, spelling, arithmetic, algebra, geometry, free drawing, grammar, and translations from the classics, fine needlework of all kinds, millinery, dressmaking, tailoring, portrait and landscape painting in oil, watercolors, and crayon, photography, sculpture, models of steamboats, locomotives, stationary engines, and railway cars, cotton presses, plows, cultivators, and reaping machines, wagons, buggies, tools of almost all kinds, from the hammer of the carpenter to the finely wrought forceps of the dentist, piano and organ, both pipe and reed, making, carpentry, cabinet making, upholstery, tin smithing, blacksmithing, boot and shoe making, basket and broom making, pottery, plain and glazed, brick making, agricultural products, including all the cereals and fruits raised in the country, silkworm culture, fruit preserving, flour from a mill, and machinery from a foundry owned by a colored man, patented inventions and improvements, nearly all of them useful and practical, were quite numerous, drugs and medicines, stationery, printing, and publishing. Some of the articles on exhibition are worthy of special mention. A black walnut pulpit, in design and finish as beautiful and tasteful as any church might wish. 
a sofa finely upholstered, and the covering embroidered with artistically executed needlework, showing four prominent events in the life of Toussaint l'Ouverture, a chandelier very beautiful in design and finely finished, a complete set of dentist's instruments in polish and finish remarkable, a little engine made by a silversmith of Knoxville, who was a slave, and who has become a skilled workman of local reputation. He never worked in a shop till he had one of his own. He learned the use of tools without any instruction. These articles would certainly merit attention, even if put in competition with similar specimens of the very best workmanship. Neither the Negroes nor their friends have any reason to regret that an exhibit was made. It was, in every sense of the word, creditable. It marks a progress simply wonderful, when all the circumstances are taken into the account. It is prophetic of a very hopeful future. It demonstrates that the Negro race can enter every profession and calling in which the white man is found. It proclaims in tones that no one should misunderstand, that he who writes or speaks of the colored people should be careful how he pronounces judgment in regard to their capacity. They should be given a white man's chance. No trade nor occupation should be closed against them. Open doors should welcome to honorable competition, white and black alike. Let this be so, and in less than half a century there will not be a trade, nor profession, nor calling, in which black men will not be found in the front. There will be preachers and professors, and editors and physicians, and lawyers and statesmen, and teachers and bankers, and businessmen and artisans, and mechanics and farmers of African descent, of whom, as brethren, the very greatest of white men will not need to be ashamed. Let writers on the Negro stop theorizing about his capacity for this or that calling, and unite in demanding that he have a fair chance to become what God has made him capable of becoming. It is wrong, it is wicked for men who by voice and pen influence public sentiment, to conclude that because the Negro is now a waiter, a bootblack, a barber, a laborer, that therefore he cannot be anything else, or even that he cannot probably be anything else. By the very force of circumstances, he has been compelled to occupy these positions. By an unjust public sentiment, he has been shut out from even an opportunity to prove his capacity to stand beside his white brother in every calling. Public sentiment should be reformed at this point, and the colored people's exhibition of what they have achieved in the short space of twenty years, in spite of opposition and in spite of lack of opportunity, assures us that if they are permitted they will contribute no small share in securing the reformation. We advise all leaders of public sentiment, who do not desire twenty-five or thirty years hence to be found eating their words of to-day, or explaining how it was that they came to be on ground so untenable, to heed the lessons of this exposition, and range themselves with those who look at facts, and who recognize the prophetic power of facts, and heartily accept the prophecy, even if this prophecy run counter to what have been their fancies. The Colored People's Educational Day at the World's Exposition called out an immense crowd and proved to be of very great interest. Speeches were made by representatives of both races. Rev. Dr. Palmer, the eloquent Presbyterian divine of New Orleans, and Col. William Preston Johnson, president of the Tulane University, represented the Louisiana Whites, and in their speeches not only complimented the colored people on the progress they had made, but assured them of the hearty sympathy and cooperation of all good people in the South. The Rev. A. E. P. Albert, a graduate of our Strait University, represented the colored people. The newspapers published his speech in full. We have read it with much interest. It is a speech of considerable power. It is an honor to the man, to his race, and to the AMA. Our student's letter this month is from Talladega College. The memories it portrays are not pleasant, but it is fitting to remember the pit out of which 
we have been digged. The darkness of the picture makes the present opportunities and privileges of the colored people to shine out all the brighter. Heartily can we thank God that these terrible things are now only a memory. End of The Colored People at the New Orleans Exposition by Anonymous First Modern Novel, A.D. 1740, by Edmund Goss, from The Great Events of Famous Historians, Volume 13, from 1905. British and American Periodical Articles, 1852 to 1905, by Various. Section 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Quote, Let me make the ballads of a nation, said Fletcher of Salton, and I care not who makes the laws. Unquote. The place which the ancient ballads held in forming the characters of the people is, in our day, more than filled by the novels. Everybody reads them, especially in the younger generation, and every character is more or less molded by the sentiments and teachings they contain. The novel has been almost entirely a modern English development. Two centuries ago our ancestors did not read fiction they had practically none to read, so that the production of the first English novel in 1740, leading as it has to the present state of affairs, may fairly be counted a most important event in the history of our race. Nowadays, 10,000 novels are published every year, and for some of these is claimed the enormous circulation of half a million copies. There is nothing offensive to the dignity of literary history in acknowledging that the most prominent piece of work effected by literature in England during the 18th century is the creation, for it can be styled nothing less, of the modern novel. In the 17th century there had been a very considerable movement in the direction of prose fiction. The pastoral romances of the Elizabethans had continued to circulate. France had set an example in the heroic stories of De Herfe and La Calprenede, which English imitators and translators had been quick to follow, even as early as 1647. The Francion of Sorel and the Roman bourgeois of Fiotier, the latter published in 1666, of especial interest to students of the English novel, had prepared the way for the exact opposite to the heroic romance, namely, the realistic story of everyday life. Bunyan and Richard Head, Mrs. Benn and Defoe, each had marked a stage in the development of English fiction. Two noble forerunners of the modern novel, Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travels, had inflamed the curiosity and awakened the appetite of British readers, but although there were already great satires and great romances in the language the first quarter of the eighteenth century passed away without revealing any domestic genius in prose fiction any master of the workings of the human heart meanwhile the drama had decayed the audiences which had attended the poetic plays of the beginning and the comedies of the close of the seventeenth century now found nothing on the boards of the theatre to satisfy their craving after intellectual excitement. The descendants of the men and women who had gone out to welcome the poetry of Shakespeare and the wit of Congreve were now rather readers than playgoers, and were most ready to enjoy an appeal to their feelings when that appeal reached them in book form. In the playhouse they came to expect bustle and pantomime rather than literature. This decline in theatrical habits prepared a domestic audience for the novelists, and accounts for that feverish and apparently excessive anxiety with which the earliest great novels were awaited and received. Meanwhile, the part taken by Addison and Steele in preparing for this change of taste must not be overlooked, and the direct link between Addison as a picturesque narrative essayist and Richardson as the first great English novelist, is to be found in Pierre de Merivaux, 1688, to 
1763, who imitated the spectator, and who is often assumed, though somewhat too rashly, to have suggested the tone of Pamela. Into this latter question we shall presently have need to inquire again. It is enough to point out here that when the English novel did suddenly and irresistibly make its appearance, it had little in common with the rococo and coquettish work which had immediately preceded it in France, and which at first, even to judges so penetrating as the poet Gray, was apt to seem more excellent because more subtle and refined. The rapidity with which the novel became domiciled among us, and the short space of time within which the principal masterpieces of the novelist were produced, are not more remarkable than the lassitude which fell upon English fiction as soon as the first great generation had passed away. The flourishing period of the eighteenth-century novel lasted exactly twenty-five years, during which time we have to record the publication of no less than fifteen eminent works of fiction. These fifteen are naturally divided into three groups. The first contains Pamela, Joseph Andrews, David Simple, and Jonathan Wilde. In these books the art is still somewhat crude, and the science of fiction incompletely understood. After a silence of five years, we reach the second and greatest selection of this central period, during which there appeared in quick succession Clarissa, Roderick Random, Tom Jones, Peregrine Pickle, Amelia, and Sir Charles Grandison. As though invention had been exhausted by the publication of this incomparable series of masterpieces, there followed another silence of five years, and then were issued, each on the heels of the other, Tristram Shandy, Rasselas, Chrysal, The Castle of Otranto, and The Vicar of Wakefield. Five years later, still, a book born out of due time appeared, Humphrey Clinker, and then, with one or two such exceptions as Evelina and Caleb Williams, no great novel appeared again in England for forty years, until, in 1811, the new school of fiction was inaugurated by Sense and Sensibility. The English novel, therefore, in its first great development, should be considered as comprised within the dates 1740 and 1766, and it may not be uninstructive, before entering into any critical examination of the separate authors, to glance at this chronological list of the first fifteen great works of English fiction. The novels contained in the catalogue just given, however widely they differed from one another in detail, had this in common, that they dealt with mental and moral phenomena. Before 1740 we possessed romances, tales, prose fiction of various sorts, but in none of these was essayed any careful analysis of character, or any profound delineation of emotion. In Defoe, where the record of imaginary fact was carried on with so much ingenuity and knowledge, the qualities we have just mentioned are notably absent. Nor can it be said that we find them in any prose writer of fiction earlier than Richardson, except in some very slight and imperfect degree in Ephra Ben, especially in her Rousseauish novel of Orinoco. The first great English novelist, Samuel Richardson, 1689 to 1761, was born and bred in Derbyshire. He records of himself that when still a little boy he had two peculiarities. He loved the society of women best, and he delighted in letter-writing. Indeed, before he was eleven, he wrote a long epistle to a widow of fifty, rebuking her for unbecoming conduct. The girls of the neighborhood soon discovered his insight into the human heart, and his skill in correspondence, and they employed the boy to write their love-letters for them. In 1706, Richardson was apprenticed to a London printer, served a diligent apprenticeship, and worked as a compositor until he arose, late in life, to be master of the stationer's company. He was fifty years of age before he showed symptoms of any higher ambition than that of printing correctly acts of Parliament and new editions of law books. In 1739 the publishers, Rivington and Osborne, 
urged him to compose for them a volume of familiar letters, afterward actually produced as an aid to illiterate persons in their correspondence. Richardson set about this work, gave it a moral flavor, and at last began to write what would serve as a caution to young serving women who were exposed to temptation. At this point he recollected a story he had heard long before of a beautiful and virtuous maidservant who succeeded in marrying her master, and then, laying the original design aside, Richardson, working rapidly, wrote in three months his famous story of Pamela. All Richardson's novels are written in what Mrs. Barbol has ingeniously described as, quote, the most natural and the least probable way of telling a story, unquote, namely in consecutive letters. The famous heroine of his first book is a young girl, Pamela Andrews, who describes in letters to her father and mother what goes on in the house of a lady with whom she had lived as maid, and who is just dead when the story opens. The son of Pamela's late mistress, a Mr. B, it was Fielding, who wickedly enlarged the name to Booby, becomes enamored of her charms, and takes every mean advantage of her defenseless position. But fortunately, Pamela is not more virtuous than astute, and after various agonies, which culminate in her thinking of drowning herself in a pond, she brings her admirer to terms, and is discovered to us at last as the rapturous, though still humble, Mrs. B. There are all sorts of faults to be found with this crude book. The hero is a rascal who comes to a good end, not because he has deserved to do so, but because his clever wife has angled for him with her beauty, and has landed him at last like an exhausted salmon. So long as Pamela is merely innocent and frightened, she is charming, but her character ceases to be sympathetic as she grows conscious of the value of her charms, and even the lax morality of the day was shocked at the craft of her latest maneuvers. But all the world went mad with pleasure over the book. What we now regard as tedious and prolix was looked upon as so much linked sweetness long drawn out. The fat printer had invented a new thing, and inaugurated a fresh order of genius. For the first time the public was invited, by a master of the movements of the heart, to be present at the dissection of that fascinating organ, and the operator could not be leisurely enough, could not be minute enough for his breathless and enraptured audience. In France, for some ten years past, there had been writers, Crébillon, Merivaux, Prévost, who had essayed this delicate analysis of emotion, but these men were the first to admit the superiority of their rough English rival. In Marianne, where the heroine tells her own story, which somewhat resembles that of Pamela, the French novelist produced a very refined study of emotion, which will probably be one day more largely read than it now is, and which should be looked through by every student of the English novel. This book is prolix and languid in form, and undoubtedly bears a curious resemblance to Richardson's novel. The English printer, however, could not read French, and there is sufficient evidence to show that he was independent of any influences save those which he took from real life. Nonetheless, of course, Marivaux, who has a name for affectation which his writings scarcely deserve, has an interest for us as a harbinger of the modern novel. Pamela was published in two volumes in 1740. The author was sufficiently ill-advised to add two more in 1741. In this latter installment, Mrs. B. was represented as a dignified matron, stately and sweet under a burden of marital infidelity, but this continuation is hardly worthy to be counted among the works of Richardson. The novelist showed great wisdom in not attempting to repeat too quickly the success of his first work. He allowed the romances of Henry and Sarah Fielding, the latter as grateful to him as the former were repugnant, to produce their effect upon the public, and it was to an audience more able to criticize fiction that Richardson addressed his next budget from the mailbag, Clarissa, 
or The History of a Young Lady, appeared in installments, but in seven volumes in all, in 1748, with critical prefaces prefixed to the first and fourth volumes. In this book, the novelist put his original crude essay completely into the shade, and added one to the masterpieces of the world. Released from the accident which induced him, in the pages of Pamela, to make his heroine a servant girl, in Clarissa, Richardson depicted a lady, yet not of so lofty a rank as to be beyond the range of his own observation. The story is again told entirely in letters. It is the history of the abduction and violation of a young lady by a finished scoundrel, and ends in the death of both characters. To enable the novelist to proceed, each personage has a confidant. The beautiful and unhappy Clarissa Harlowe corresponds with the vivacious Miss Howell. Robert Lovelace addresses his friend and quondam fellow reveller John Belford. The character of Clarissa is summed up in these terms by her creator, a young lady of great delicacy, mistress of all the accomplishments, natural and acquired, that adorn the sex, having the strictest notions of filial duty. Her piety and purity, in fact, are the two lodestars of her moral nature, and the pursuit of each leads her life to shipwreck. By the universal acknowledgment of novel readers, Clarissa is one of the most sympathetic, as she is one of the most lifelike of all the women in literature, and Richardson has conducted her story with so much art and tact that her very faults canonize her, and her weakness crowns the triumph of her chastity. In depicting the character of Lovelace, the novelist had a difficult task, for to have made him a mere ruffian would have been to ruin the whole purpose of the piece. He is represented as witty, versatile, and adroit, the very type of the unscrupulous gentleman of fashion of the period. He expiates his crimes. At the close of a capital duel by the hands of Colonel Morden, a relative of the Harlow family, who has seen Clarissa die. The success of Clarissa, both here and in France, was extraordinary. As the successive volumes appeared, and readers were held in suspense as to the fate of the exquisite heroine, Richardson was deluged with letters entreating him to have mercy. The women of England knelt sobbing round his knees, and addressed him as though he possessed the power of life and death. The slow and cumbrous form of Clarissa has tended to lessen the number of its students, but there is probably no one who reads at all widely who has not at one time or another come under the spell of this extraordinary book. In France its reputation has always stood very high. Diderot said that it placed Richardson with Homer and Euripides. Rousseau openly imitated it, and Alfred de Musset has styled it the best novel in the world. To those who love to see the passions taught to move at the command of sentiment, and who are not wearied by the excessively minute scale as of a moral miniature painter on which the author designs his work, there can scarcely be recommended a more thrilling and affecting book. The author is entirely inexorable, and the reader must not hope to escape until he is thoroughly purged with terror and pity. After the further development of Fielding's genius, and after the advent of a new luminary in Smollett, Richardson once more presented to the public an elaborate and ceremonious novel of extreme prolixity. The history of Sir Charles Grandison, in seven and six volumes, appeared in the spring of 1754, after having been pirated in Dublin during the preceding winter. Richardson's object in this new adventure was, having already painted the portraits of two virtuous young women, the one fortunate, the other a martyr, to produce this time a virtuous hero, and to depict the character and actions of a man of true honor, as before in a series of familiar letters. There is more movement, more plot, in this novel than in the previous ones. The hero is now in Italy, now in England, and there is much more attempt than either in Pamela 
or Clarissa to give the impression of a sphere in which a man of the world may move. Grandison is, however, a slightly ludicrous hero. His perfections are those of a prig and an egoist, and he passes like the sun itself over his parterre of adoring worshippers. The ladies who are devoted to Sir Charles Grandison are, indeed, very numerous, but the reader's interest centers in three of them, the mild and estimable Harriet Byron, the impassioned Italian Clementina della Porretta, and the ingenuous ward Emily Gervois. The excuse for all this is that this paragon of manly virtue has the most delicate of human minds and that women are irresistibly attracted to him by his splendid perfections of character. But posterity has admitted that the portrait is insufferably overdrawn, and that Grandison is absurd. The finest scenes in this interesting but defective novel are those in which the madness of Clementina is dwelt upon in that long, drawn, patient manner of which Richardson was a master. The book is much too long. Happy in the fame which the three daughters of his pen had brought him, and enjoying prosperous circumstances, Richardson's life closed in a sort of perpetual tea-party, in which he, the only male, sat surrounded by bevies of adoring ladies. He died in London of apoplexy on July 4th, 1761. His manners were marked by the same ceremonious stiffness which gives his writing an air of belonging to a far earlier period than that of Fielding or Smollett, but his gravity and sentimental earnestness only help to endear him to the women. Of the style of Richardson there is little to be said. The reader never thinks of it. If he forces himself to regard it, he sees that it is apt to be slipshod, although so trim and systematic. Richardson was a man of unquestionable genius, dowered with extraordinary insight into female character, and possessing the power to express it but he had little humor no rapidity of mind and his speech was so ductile and so elaborate that he can scarcely compete with later and sharper talents end of first modern novel eighty seventeen forty by edmund goss Modern Types by Mr. Punch's Own Typewriter From Punch or the London Charvari, Volume 98, March 15, 1890 By Anonymous British and American Periodical Articles, 1852-1905 to By Various Section 6 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Number 4. The Giddy Society Lady The Giddy Lady is one who, having been plunged at an early age into smart society, is whirled perpetually round in a vortex of pleasures and excitements. In the effort to keep her head above water, she is as likely as not to lose it. This condition she naturally describes as being in the swim. In the unceasing struggle to maintain herself there, she may perhaps shorten her life, but she will apparently find a compensation in the increased length of her dressmaker's bills. She is ordinarily the daughter of aristocratic parents, who carefully allowed her to run wild from the moment she could run at all. By their example she has been taught to hold as articles of her very limited faith that the serious concerns of life are of interest only to fools, and should, therefore, though the inference is not obvious, be entirely neglected by herself, and that frivolity and fashion are the twin deities before whom every self-respecting woman must bow down. Having left the seminary, at which she acquired an elementary ignorance of spelling, a smattering of French phrases as used by English lady novelists, and a taste in music which leads her in after-life to prefer Miss Bessie Bellwood to Beethoven, she is soon afterwards brought out at a smart dance in London. From this point her progress is rapid. Balls and concerts, luncheons and receptions, dinners and theatres, 
race meetings and cricket matches, at both of which more attention is paid to fashion than to the field, follow one another in a dizzy succession. She has, naturally, no time for thought, but in order to avoid the least suspicion of it, she learns to chatter the slang of the youthful guardsmen and others who are her companions. A certain flashing style of beauty ensures her to the devotion of numerous admirers, to whom she babbles of chappies and johnnies and real jam and stony broke and two to one bar one, as if her life depended upon this correct pronunciation of as many of these phrases as possible in the shortest time on record. She thus comes to be considered a cheerful companion, and at the end of her third season marries a jaded man of pleasure, whose wealth is more considerable than his personal attractions, and who, for some inscrutable reason, has been approved by her parents as a suitable husband. She treats matrimony as an emancipation from rules which she has rarely seen any one else observe, and has never honored herself, and after a few years she becomes one of that gaudy band of society ladies who follow with respectful imitation the giddy vagaries of the Corinthians of a lower grade. She dines often without her husband, at smart restaurants, where she has constant opportunities of studying the manners of her models. She adores the burlesques at the Gaiety and the Avenue, and talks, with a complete absence of reserve and a disregard of pedantic accuracy, about the lives and adventures of the actresses who figure there. She can tell you, and does, who presented Lottie A. with a diamond star, and who was present at the last supper party in honor of Totty B., nor is she averse to being seen and talked about in a box at a music hall, or at one of the pleasure palaces in Leicester Square. She allows the young men who cluster round her to suppose that she knows all about their lapses from strict propriety, and that she commends rather than condemns them. Causes celeb are to her a staple of conversation, her interest in them varying directly as the number of co-respondents. It is impossible, therefore, that the men who are her friends should treat her with that chivalrous respect which an obsolete tradition would seem to require, but they suffer no loss of her esteem in consequence. Such being her behavior in the society of men, the tone of her daily conversation with friends of her own sex may be readily imagined, though it might not be pleasant to describe. Suffice it to say that she sees no shame in addressing them, or in allowing herself to be addressed by a name which a court of law has held to be libelous when applied to a burlesque actress. She is always at Hurlingham or the Rainlaw, and has seen pigeons killed without a qualm. She never misses a Sandown or a Kempton meeting. She dazzles the eyes of the throng at Ascot every year, and never fails at Goodwood. Twice a year the giddy lady is compelled by the traditions of her caste to visit Paris, in order to replenish her exhausted wardrobe. On these occasions she patronizes only the best hotel, and the most expensive and celebrated of men dressmakers, and she is fitted by a son of the house, of whom she talks constantly and familiarly by his Christian name as Jean or Pierre or Philippe. During the shooting season she goes from country house to country house. She has been seen, sometimes, with a gun in her hands, often with a lighted cigarette between her lips. Indeed, she is too frequent a visitor at shooting luncheons and in smoking rooms, where a woman, however much she may attempt to disguise her sex, is never cordially welcomed by men. The conventions of the society in which she moves seem to require that she should be attended during her visits by a cavalier servant, who is therefore always invited with her. Their pastime is to imitate a flirtation and to burlesque love, but neither of them is ever deceived into attributing the least reality to this occupation, which is often as harmless as it is always absurd. 
These and similar occupations, of course, leave her no time to attend to her children, who are left to grow up as best they may under the fostering care of nursery maids and of such relations as may choose, from time to time, to burden themselves with the olive branches of others. Her husband has long since retired from all competition with her, and leaves her free to follow her own devices, whilst he himself follows the odds. She is often supposed to be riding for a fall. It is certain that her pace is fast, yet, though many whisper, it is quite possible that she will ride to the end without open damage. Of her dress and her jewels, it need only be said that she affects tailor-made costumes and cat's-eye bangles by day, and that at night she escapes by the skin of her teeth from that censure which the scantiness of her coverings would seem to warrant, and which Mr. Horsley, R.A., if he saw her, would be certain to pronounce. In middle age she loses her brilliant complexion. Yet, for reasons best known to herself, her color continues to be bright, though her spirits and her temper seem to suffer in the effort to keep it so. As old age advances, she is as likely as not to become a gorgon of immaculate propriety, and will be heard lamenting over the laxity of manners which permits girls to do what was never dreamt of when she was a girl herself. End of Modern Types, The Giddy Society Lady, by Mr. Punch's own typewriter. An ADLL Adventure in Liverpool From Chambers' Edinburgh Journal, number 441, volume 17, new series, June 12, 1852. Editors Robert and William Chambers British and American Periodical Articles, 1852-1905, to by Various. Section 7. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Liverpool has perhaps fewer relics of an archaeological nature than any other town in the United Kingdom, and this at first seems a little singular when we remember that it is not without its place in the more romantic eras of our history, and that a castle of considerable strength once lent it protection. Its old castle, its towers, and the walls by which it was surrounded have all been swept away by the busy crowds that now throng its thoroughfares. Even the former names of places have in most instances been altered, as if to obliterate all recollections and associations connected with its early history. Thus, a row of houses, which a few years ago bore the not very euphonious name of Castle Ditch, from its having followed a portion of the line of the moat by which the fortress which once stood near it was surrounded, was changed into St. George's Crescent, and many others underwent similar transmutations. But if the physical aspect of the place holds out few or no attractions to the antiquary, the moral one of its inhabitants, in so far as his favorite subject is concerned, is equally uninviting. For, taken as a whole, it would be difficult to find a population less influenced by or interested in such studies. The only relic of the olden times which Liverpool has for a long time past retained was a long, low, picturesque-looking, thatched cottage in the small village of Everton, of Toffee, notoriety, which went by the name of Prince Rupert's Cottage, from its having been the headquarters of that fiery leader when he besieged the town from the ridge on which the village is situated. But even this was swept away about six years ago by the proprietor to allow a street which he had mapped out to abut upon the village at the point it occupied. The project did not succeed, and the outline of the contemplated street is all that as yet marks out the spot where this interesting object stood. I confess to the soft impeachment of having been, at a very early period of my life, inoculated with the true Monk Barnes enthusiasm, and I have always been a great admirer of that beautiful remark of Lord Bacon's, that antiquities may be considered as the planks of a wreck which wise and prudent 
men gather and preserve from the deluge of time. Some months ago, I was walking along what is called the Breck Road, leading out of the little village of Everton, of which I have been speaking, when my attention was arrested by a market cross in a field on the opposite side of the road. I was somewhat surprised that it had escaped my notice when I formerly passed that way, and I immediately crossed over to examine it. It was formed, as all the English market crosses are, of a series of flat steps with an upright shaft in the center, it was built of the red sandstone of the district, and bore the appearance of great antiquity. The field was not far from what might be called the principal street of the village, and as I was aware that considerable changes had taken place of late years in the neighborhood, it occurred to me as possible that at one time the cross might have occupied the center of a space on which the markets were held. My time, however, being limited, I was unable to make any immediate inquiries regarding it, but resolved to take an early opportunity of making myself acquainted with its early history so as to rescue one interesting relic at least of the place from apparently a very undeserved obscurity this opportunity did not present itself for some weeks but at length it did occur and i started for the place to collect all the information both traditional and otherwise which i could regarding it on arriving at the spot my surprise may be conceived, for it cannot be described, when, on looking at the field where it stood, I found that it had been removed, and all that remained to point out the place was the bare mark on the grass of the spot which it had occupied. The consternation of Aladdin, when he got up on one fine morning and found that his gorgeous palace had vanished during the night, was hardly greater than mine on making this sad discovery and like him i dare say i rubbed my eyes in hopes that my visual organs had deceived me but with as little success on looking to the other side of the road i observed a mason at work repairing the opposite wall with some very suspicious-looking stones and i immediately crossed over and commenced a categorical examination of the supposed delinquent I inquired whether he could explain to me the cause of the removal of the ancient cross, which used to be in the field exactly opposite to where we were then standing. But he said that, although he was an old residenter in Everton, he had not even been aware of the existence of such an object. This I set down as an additional instance of the want of interest which the natives of the place take in archaeological subjects. He told me, however, that about three weeks previously he had observed several men facing the wall opposite the large stones, which they brought apparently from some place close at hand, but that, having his own work to attend to, he had not bestowed any particular thought on the matter. He said the field was rented by a person for the purpose of cleaning carpets, and he had no doubt the removal had been accomplished by his directions. On stepping across the road, I found these suspicions completely realized, for there, resting on the top of the wall, were the time-honored steps of the cross of my anxiety. Luckily for me, at least, the tenant was not at hand at the time, as in the state of excitement in which I was, I might have done or said something which I should afterwards have regretted. I had no alternative but to return to town nursing my wrath to keep it warm, and thinking over the best and most efficacious method in which I could accomplish the punishment of the aggressor, whoever he might be, and procuring the restoration of the cross in all its primitive simplicity. I thought of an article in the papers, into which all my caustic and sarcastic powers were to be concentrated and discharged on the head of the desecrator, then of calling on the lord of the manor and mentioning the matter to him, so as, if possible, to carry his influence along with me, although I thought it quite probable that he might have sanctioned the spoliation to save the expense of new stones for the repair of his tenant's wall. Under this latter impression, therefore, and previous to carrying either of these belligerent intentions into effect, 
I thought it would only be fair to give the obnoxious man an opportunity of explaining the circumstances under which he had assumed such an unwarranted responsibility. Accordingly, a short time afterwards, I again wended my way towards the field, determined to bring the matter, in some way or other, to a bearing, when I saw a very pleasant-looking man standing at the door of the house in which the carpet-cleansing operations are carried on. Supposing him to be the delinquent, I endeavored to bridle my rising collar as much as possible, while I asked him whether he could tell me anything about the removal of the cross which had once stood in that field. With a gentle smile, which I thought at the time almost demoniac, he mildly replied that he had removed it, because the object for which he had erected it about twelve months before had ceased to exist, and he had taken the stones to repair the wall close by where it had stood. The shock which the nervous system of our worthy friend Monkbarns received when the exclamation of Edie Ochiltree fell upon his ear, of Praetorium here, Praetorium there, I mind the big and was not greater than that which mine sustained on receiving this death-blow to all my hopes of rescuing this interesting relic of antiquity from its unmerited oblivion. Gulping down my mortification as best I could, I, in as indifferent a manner as I could assume, craved the liberty of inquiring what the circumstances were which had led to such a fanciful employment of his time. He told me that he had been a carpet manufacturer in Oxfordshire, but had been unsuccessful in business, and had come here and set up his present establishment for the cleaning of the articles which he formerly manufactured, and that, wishing to add to his income by every legitimate means within his power, he had been supplied regularly with a quantity of Banbury cakes, for the sale of which he had erected a temporary wooden hut in one corner of his field. That one morning early, about eighteen months ago, as he was lying awake in bed, the thought struck him that as there were a great many large flat stones lying in the corner of the field, he would erect them, in front of the hut, into the form of the well-known cross of equestrian nursery rhyme notoriety. He immediately rose, and, summoning his workmen, succeeded in making a very tolerable imitation of the world-wide known cross, but that, after about twelve months' trial of his cake speculation, finding it did not succeed, he gave it up, and, removing the cross of which it was the sign, turned the stones to a more useful purpose. Thus ended my daydream connected with this interesting relic, and nothing, I am sure, but that indomitable enthusiasm which distinguishes all genuine disciples of the Monkbarns school could have sustained me under my grievous disappointment. End of an ADLL adventure in Liverpool. Dungeness, General Green's Sea Island Plantation, by Frederick A. Ober, from Lippincott's Magazine of Popular Literature and Science, Volume 26, August 1880. British and American Periodical Articles, 1852 to 1905, by Various. Section 8. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Southernmost of those famed sea islands of Georgia, lying right in sight of Florida's northern shore, on the northern verge of the tropic borderland, Cumberland Island presents its beachfront to the ocean. It unites within itself all those attractions which have made Florida famous, all but river and lake. It has the balmiest climate in the south. The vegetation of its forests is semi-tropical. It has game in abundance. It has all these, and yet its territory is now a waste. In November I visited it, and again in April, and later in August. To reach it, one must go first to St. Mary's, the town farthest south on the Georgia coast, or to Fernandina, the northernmost city in Florida, 
In either case, he will have to hire a boat and a boatman, and in either case, he must carry with him his provisions. St. Mary's in April is St. Mary's in August, a drowsy, quaint old town, warm in the daytime and cool at night, hot in the sunlight, but with cool sea breezes. The streets of St. Mary's are her glory. They are one hundred feet wide, carpeted with a green sward, smooth as a shaven lawn, lined with live oaks and china trees. In April the latter are in full bloom, their lilac blossoms hanging in dense panicles, the green leaves flecking them just enough to afford contrast, and the somber Spanish moss depending gracefully from every branch and limb. Great gaudy butterflies are continually hovering over them, and fluttering uneasily from flower to flower, and gleaming hummingbirds, our own northern summer visitors, the Trochilus colubris, are flashing from tree to tree, now poised a moment in air, now sipping honey from the tiny cups. From the lighthouse dome at Fernandina, one can look over half the island, trace the white sand beach miles to the south, follow it north till it curves inland, where Amelia Sound, the mouth of the St. Mary's River, forms the harbor. Away north runs up Cumberland Beach, and among the trees and over a broad stretch of marsh gleam white the ruins of Dungeness. West, again, one sees the gloomy pines of the mainland, behind which the sun goes down, lighting gloriously the marsh and silver threads of the river. Unlike the seasons of the north, there is here no perceptible line of demarcation between them. We cannot positively assert that spring has opened, or summer or winter begun. As for autumn and harvest time, the crops are being continually gathered in. So, since the year came in, I have seen various plants and shrubs in bloom that ought to open with spring. Up the Oklawaha, in January, I saw the blackberry, or dewberry, in blossom, and ever since, along the St. John's in that month, and February, on the banks of the St. Mary's in February and March, and even here, in Fernandina and St. Mary's, it is blossoming and bearing fruit. It is this week the first week in April, that we obtain the first fruit for the table, buying it for ten cents a quart. It puzzles one to think of planting. When must he begin? Last Christmas one of our truck farmers had a large crop of peas ready to harvest. A chance frost gobbled them up, however. Now, April, peas and potatoes are in their prime. By the middle of April the china trees have dropped their blossoms, and the streets beneath are strewn with withered flowers. The fragrance that filled the air has departed with the hummingbirds and butterflies. The pomegranate still continues in bloom. Its vividly scarlet flowers have delighted us ever since the middle of March. The figs commenced leafing with the month. Now they are green with broad leaves, and in the axle of each appears the rudiment of a fruit. They are grotesquely gnarled and twisted, taking most unthought-of shapes and positions. The mockingbirds have mated and begun the construction of their nests. Their music is delightful. Nearly all the day long they sing, and sometimes in the night. It seems almost wicked, to mercenary man, to think that birds worth twenty-five dollars apiece are freely fluttering about unharmed. When the breeding season has opened, however, it will not close without some family of mockingbirds being made desolate, for the young Ethiopian hath an ear for music, and most eagerly seeketh the young bird in its downy nest, trusting to the unsuspecting Yankee. Renumeration, therefore. The month went out in glorious style. Every morning of its thirty days had opened with unclouded sky, and each night's sun went down with a blaze of glory that flooded the marshes with golden light, and left painted on the sky clouds of royal purple and crimson. Two or three showers sprang upon us in the afternoon, ending after a stay of an hour or two, cooling the air and refreshing weary man most wonderfully. Plums and peaches are nearly grown and turning color. They afford another illustration of the dilatory motions of vegetation here. In January, I left some plum trees in full bloom. 
Returning a month later, I found the same trees still white with flowers. The peaches were pink with bloom in February and March, and even in April some blushing flowers appear. This was Fernandina and St. Mary's in April. In August, the latter town has changed but little. The streets were as green as in early spring. The flowers were fewer, but the air was heavy with the fragrance of crepe myrtle and orange. It was hot in the morning, but an early breeze from the ocean soon came in, blowing with refreshing coolness all day long. It was even pleasanter than in spring and winter, the air clearer and more bracing, and annoying insects had disappeared. St. Mary's is intimately connected with Cumberland Island in history. In the War of 1812, the island was taken, and the slaves were offered their freedom by Admiral Cockburn. But such was their attachment to the place, and their masters, that but one availed himself of this opportunity to escape. At Point Peter, where the main land of Georgia terminates in the marshes of St. Mary's, a fight occurred, and there are yet the remains of an earthwork thrown up by the Americans to repulse the British fleet in its advance on St. Mary's. The oldest inhabitant of St. Mary's, who is said to have scored a century, old Daddy Patty, a negro who bears in his face the tattooing of his native Africa, participated in that fight. He lives in a little cabin on a street by the wharf and devotes his time to fishing, at which he is very expert. Upon being questioned regarding the fight, he seemed rather hazy as to dates, but was positive as to the time he first saw America. De wa ob de revenu was dis peace when I land in Charleston from Africa. Was young man den, just growed. No, sir, never saw Jenna Washington, but hear of him, sir. He fought with de British, sir, and gained de victory at New Orleans, sir. That was General Jackson, uncle. No, sir, General Jackson. Mot have been there, but General Washington, he had a hand in it. Yes, sir, as de first settler, sir, was in St. Mary's afore the street was laid out, in 1787, and twas all big gall and hammock. The Indian name of Cumberland Island was Miso, beautiful land, and this was changed when Oglethorpe visited the island, at the request of an Indian chief who had received some kindness from the Duke of Cumberland. It is related in an old English record, of which I have seen a copy, that the Duke was so well pleased at this evidence of good will that he caused a hunting lodge to be erected there, and named it Dungeness, after his country seat, Castle Dungeness, on the Cape of Dungeness in the county of Kent. From that time until the breaking out of the Revolution it was owned successively by peers of the British realm. The island is eighteen miles in length, and from half a mile to three miles in breadth. The soil is sandy, adapted to the culture of cotton, corn, potatoes, etc., pomegranates, olives, dates, figs, limes, lemons, orange, and melons yield abundant crops. The great frost of 1835, which extended over the entire peninsula of Florida, destroyed the fine groves of orange trees. At one time, this fruit was shipped in schooner loads, and from one tree three thousand oranges have been gathered. The forest trees are live oak, cedar, and a few pines. A most interesting fact in the history of the island is found in its chronicles, for here were obtained the timbers for the Constitution, Old Ironsides, that noble frigate so well known to every American. Some of the stumps of the indestructible live oak, from which the timber was cut for her ribs, may yet be seen. Deer, raccoons, bear, and possum are abundant in the thick forest. The climate is temperate and healthy. Many of the former slaves live to a great age. The island has never been affected by fever, while the town of Brunswick, to the north, and Fernandina, just across the channel to the south, have been scourged by Yellow Jack. Cumberland has ever remained untouched. St. Mary's, across the marshes on the mainland, also boasts this immunity. 
The creeks of the marshes swarm with fish of every sort, and there are oyster beds containing large and toothsome bivalves. With possums and coons, fish and oysters, it is strange that Cuffy clung to his old home long after his master had left it. Is it a matter of wonder that there yet seems a remnant of the old slave population, houseless and poverty-stricken, clinging to the island that once gave them so delightful a home? At the close of the war, it is related, Mr. Stafford, proprietor of the central portion of the island, burned his negro houses to the ground, telling his people to go, as he had no more use for them, nor they for him. Cumberland today is nearly depopulated. The fertile cotton and cornfields run to waste, and wild hogs and half-wild horses roam over the pasture and scrub that cover once cultivated fields. The history of this island commences with that of Georgia. We read that in 1742 the Spaniards invaded Georgia and landed on the island. With a fleet of thirty-six sail, and with more than three thousand troops from Havana and St. Augustine, they entered the harbor of St. Simons, north of Cumberland, and erected a battery of twenty guns. General Oglethorpe, with eight hundred men, exclusive of Indians, was then on the island. He withdrew to his fort at Frederica, and anxiously awaited reinforcements from Carolina. By turning to account the desertion of a French soldier, he precipitated the attack of the Spaniards, and, on their march to Frederica, they fell into an ambuscade. Great slaughter ensued, and they retreated precipitately. The place of conflict is to this day known as Bloody Marsh. The Spaniards retreated south along the coast in their vessels, and on their way attacked Fort William, at the southern extremity of Cumberland Island, but were repulsed with loss. This fort, which was constructed, I think, by Oglethorpe, is placed on the extreme southern end of Cumberland in a map of the island made in 1802. Even then the fort was half submerged at high water, and at the present day its site is far out in the channel. The water of the river mouth is constantly encroaching upon the land, and the ruins of a house once standing upon the southern point may be seen, it is said, beneath the water at low tide. Old Fort William has been seen within the memory of residents of St. Mary's, but likewise beneath the waves. About 1770 that rare naturalist and botanist, William Bartram, landed here and traversed the island being set across to Amelia Island, Fernandina, by a hunter whom he found living here. He was then at the commencement of his romantic journeyings among the Seminole Indians up the St. John's River, then running through a wilderness. Another fortification, Fort St. Andrew, situated on the northwest point of the island, may still be traced by the ruins of its walls. A well is known there into which, it is said, the English threw ten thousand pounds in silver upon the approach of the Spaniards. In this way, by vestiges of foundation walls, are indicated the various settlements of the island, mansions and cabins that have passed away, leaving no other sign but these sad memorials of the past. At the conclusion of peace, and immediately after the close of the revolution, the southern portion of Cumberland Island came into the possession of General Nathaniel Green. It is said by some to have been presented to him by the state of Georgia, in connection with the beautiful estate of Mulberry Grove, where he removed with his family and took up his residence. His lamentably premature death prevented the consummation of his design to build here a retreat in which to spend the hot summer months. He had resided but a year upon his estate of Mulberry Grove, and had hardly commenced to beautify and adorn this chosen residence of his maturer years when a sunstroke cut him down in the prime of his life. The general had selected the site of the mansion to be built at Dungeness, and had planned the grounds, laid out a garden, which subsequently became famous for its tropical products and roses, and had lined through the forests of live oak those avenues which have since grown to such magnificent proportions. As had been related, he did not live to see the completion of his work, but died almost at its very inception. In 1786, the year of his death, 
The foundation walls were laid of the mansion home of Dungeness, but the building was not finished till 1803. Even after it had been occupied for years, and during the sixty years and more it was used as a residence by the descendants of General Green, there remained a few unfinished rooms. A tradition in the family to the effect that some great misfortune would befall it if the building were finished prevented, it is said, its completion. In the early part of the present century, it was the most elegant residence on the coast. A mound of shells, the accumulation of centuries, and the result of countless Indian feasts, rose high above the southern marsh of Cumberland. A forest of live oaks surrounded it on three sides, and at its feet ran the broad creek which wound through the marsh for miles, seeking the sound at a point opposite the Florida shore. Here, for ages of time, the Indians of the South had resorted to feast upon the oysters with which the creek was filled. The creek Indians, the most honorable with whom the United States ever had dealings, from whom sprang the Seminoles, and who occupied the entire territory of Georgia and Carolina at the period of the white man's advent, were the last who aided in the erection of this monument to a race now passed away. The summit of this shell mound was level for the site of the house, and a terrace area of an acre or more constructed with the shells. Upon this base, raised above the general level of the island, its foundations were laid. It was four stories in height above the basement, and from cellar stone to eaves was forty-five feet. There were four chimneys and sixteen fireplaces, and twenty rooms above the first floor. The walls at the base were six feet in thickness, and above the ground four feet. They were composed of the material known as tabby, a mixture of shells, lime, and broken stone, or gravel, with water, which mass, being pressed in a mold of boards, becomes, when dry, as hard and durable as rock. The walls are now as solid as stone itself. The second story above the terrace contained the principal rooms. The room in the southeast corner was the drawing-room in the time of the Shaws and the Nightingales. The room immediately back of the drawing-room, in the northeast corner, was the dining-room. A wide hall ran through the center, upon the opposite side of which were two rooms, used respectively as school and sewing-room. Above these apartments, in the third story, were the chambers. That directly above the drawing-room is the most interesting of all, for it was occupied by General Harry Lee, who was confined there by sickness, and there died. The interior of the house corresponded with its exterior in beauty of finish and magnificence of decoration and appointments. Enclosed by a high wall of masonry, the tabby just described, was a tract of twelve acres devoted to the cultivation of flowers and tropical fruits. This wall, now broken down in places and overgrown with ivy and trumpet vines, yet divides the garden from the larger fields, once devoted to cotton and cane. The gardener's house was next the mansion, and joined to it by this high wall. The garden lay to the south, reaching the marsh in successive terraces. On and about the semicircular terrace, immediately around the house, were planted crepe myrtle, clove trees, and sago palms. Some yet remained to indicate what an Eden-like retreat was this garden of spices and bloom half a century ago. The first broad terrace, which ran the entire length of the garden wall east and west, was divided by an avenue of olives, which separated in front of the house, leaving a space in which there were two noble magnolias. A broad walk ran from the house to the lower garden, which was divided from the other by a thick-set hedge of mock orange. In this garden was another walk bordered by olives. This space was entirely devoted to flowers. On each side was a grove of orange trees, and in the lower garden were the fig, India rubber, and date palm, the golden date of Africa. Of trees there were the camphor tree, coffee, Portuguese laurel, tree of paradise, grape myrtle, guava, lime, orange, citron, pomegranate, sago palm, and many others whose home is in the tropics. The delicious climate of this island, several degrees warmer than that of the mainland, 
in the same latitude, enabled the proprietors of this insular paradise to grow nearly all the fruits of the torrid zone. A little tongue of land runs from the garden into the marsh, an elevation of the original shell mount, covered with oaks hung with long gray moss. This was called the park, and here the inhabitants of this favored estate would resort for recreation in the afternoon and evening. Near this strip of land, beneath the shade of an immense live oak, luxuriates a clump of West India bamboo, said to have originated from a single stock brought here by General Lee. The feathery lances clash and rattle with all the wild abandon characteristic of them in their native isles. I have not seen a more perfect group outside the islands of the Caribbean Sea. From the walls of the second story, if you wish to view the wide extended prospect to the south, you must clamber there. You can look across 3,000 acres of salt marsh to Fernandina and St. Mary's, along the river and beach, across miles of ocean. Ivy climbs the corner wall of the ruins and covers the garden wall and trees. Ruin everywhere stares you in the face. On every side are deserted fields and gardens, fields that employed the labor of 400 Negroes, fields that were fertile and yielded large crops of the famous Sea Island cotton. Bales from this estate were never sampled. The Sea Island cotton that took the prize at the World's Fair in London was raised on this island. East of the garden, stretching toward the ocean beach, is the olive grove. Seventy years ago, the first olive trees were imported from Italy and the south of France. They grew and flourished, and years ago this grove yielded a profit to its owners. In 1755, Mr. Henry Lawrence of South Carolina imported and planted olives, capers, limes, ginger, etc., and in 1785 the olive was successfully grown in South Carolina, but probably there is not at the present day a grove equal in extent to this. It was estimated that a large tree would average a gallon of oil per year. There were 800 planted and brought to a flourishing and profitable stage of growth. There are several hundred now, scattered through a waste of briars and scrub and overgrown with moss. But in the avenues, in the hottest day, there are shade and coolness beneath the intertwined branches of the live oaks that arch above them. The eye is refreshed in gazing down these vistas over the leaf-strewn floors of sand. The sunshine sifts through the arch above, flecking the roadway with a mosaic of leaves and boughs in light and shade. From the limbs hang graceful pennons of Spanish moss, festooned at the sides, waved by every wind, changing in every light. Grapevines, with stems six inches in diameter, climb into the huge oaks and swing from tree to tree, linking limb with limb. The treetops are purple with great fruit clusters. To the whole scene, the dwarf palmetto gives a semi-tropic aspect. There are no signs of life, save a lizard darting over the leaves, stopping midway to look at you with bright eyes. In the evening, the squirrels come out in countless numbers, and their crashing leaps may be heard in all directions. Bright cardinal birds, Florida jays and gay nonpareils enliven the, the gloom. The jays chatter in the branches, and mockingbirds carol from the topmost limbs. It is one of the joys of earth to walk through the grand avenue of Dungeness at sunset. There were, when the estate was in prosperous condition, eleven miles of avenues, seven miles of beach, eight miles of walks, and nine miles of open roads. Grand Avenue, running midway the length of the island, was cleared eighteen miles to High Point. There are now but three miles cleared, but you can look straight down beneath the arch of live oaks for more than a mile of its length. From the Sound to the beach, crossing Central Avenue, ran River Avenue for a distance of about a mile. This live oak forest, which covers several thousand acres, is densely filled with scrub palmetto, impenetrable almost, and so difficult to pierce that the deer with which the forest swarms choose the old paths and roadways in their walks from sleeping to feeding grounds. The hunters take advantage of this, and after starting their dogs in the scrub, post themselves on the main avenues where the paths intersect, and shoot the deer as they jump out. 
The deer of the island are estimated by thousands, and a state law which prohibits the hunting of deer with dogs, except with the owner's permission, has aided in their increase. Halfway up the island are numerous ponds, to which ducks resort in the winter in vast numbers. Bear are plentiful in the deep woods, and their tracks, with those of the deer in greater abundance, are often found crossing the abandoned fields. Three hundred feet in width, hard as stone, shell-strewn between wind-hollowed sand dunes and foaming surf, this beach of Cumberland stretches for twenty miles. The sands that border it are covered with a network of beautiful convolvulus, tufts of sea oats with nodding plumes, and picturesque clumps of Spanish bayonet, yoca gloriosa, with pyramids of snowy flowers. This and the prickly pear suggest the climate of the tropics. I find them on the sand hills bordering the ocean beach, the wind-swept dunes between the beach hammock and the hard sand of the wave-washed beach. They are called barren by many, these sand hills of the Atlantic coast, but I never find them so. To me they are always attractive, whether I am traversing the sand slopes of Cape Cod or the similar ones of Florida. Even the grasses possess a character of their own, gracefully erect, tiny circles traced about them where the last wind has caused them to brush the sand. Here, too, are grasses rare and beautiful, the feathery foxtail, the tall, loose-branched sea-oats, and many others with names unknown, which you may see ornamenting the famous palmetto hats. So fascinating are these sand dunes that one wanders among them for hours, following in the paths worn by the feet of cattle which roam these hills and the neighboring marsh in a half-wild state. Sometimes the banks will shelve abruptly, hollowed out by the wind, and one can look down into a hole ten or twenty feet deep, arched over by thorn bushes, grapevines, and a species of bay. These sand caverns are of frequent occurrence. There are clumps of scrubby oak completely covered with scarlet honeysuckle and trumpet flower. While seeking to investigate one of these, I startled a hen quail, which, after whirring rapidly out of sight, returned and manifested much anxiety by plaintive calls. This is a queer place for quail, in the neighborhood of old fields where they can easily run out and glean a hasty meal from weeds and broken ground, is their chosen place for a nest. Along the surface of the sea, long lines of pelicans pursue a lumbering flight. Graceful turns, sea swallows, skim the waves. A great blue heron stalks across the hard sand, majestic, solitary, and shy of man's approach, and dainty little beach birds, piping plover, and snowy white, and drab, glide rapidly past the surf line. A mile below Beach Avenue is a high sand hill shelving abruptly toward the beach, half-buried trees projecting from its western slope. It is now known as Eagle Cliff, so called by the proprietor of Dungeness, from the fact of my shooting an eagle there one day in November. In the beach hammock are the same wind-hollowed hills, rooted into permanence by twisted oaks and magnolias. Upon their limbs in April, the Spanish moss and air plants were just blossoming, the former into little star-like, hardly discernible flowers, the latter throwing up a green stem with a pink terminal bud, which in August had burst into a spike of crimson flowers. Curious lichens covered the rough trunks of these oaks, some gray, some ashy white, some pink, some scarlet like blotches of blood. The michella, the little partridge berry, is here in bloom, and has been since the year came in. The marsh that borders the beach hammock and spreads a sea of silvery green before the mansion is not barren of attractions. Inquisitive and faint-hearted fiddler crabs are darting in and out of their holes in the mud. An alligator now and then shows a hint of a head above the water of the creek, along whose banks walk daintily and proudly aigrets and herons robed in white and from the reeds of which myriads of water-hens send up a deafening chatter. Midway between the mansion and the beach, in the southern corner of the orchard of olive-trees, which overhang and surround it, is the graveyard of the family. 
It is the last object to which in this narrative I call attention, but to the visitor it is the most interesting, the fullest of memories of the past. By a winding and secluded path from the deserted garden, along the banks of the solitary marsh, beneath great water oaks hung with funereal moss, one reaches this little cemetery, a few roods of ground walled in from the adjoining corpsewood, a lonesome acre thinly grown with grass and wandering vines. Three tombs and three headstones indicate at least six of the graves with which this little lot is filled. In one of these graves rest the bones of her who shared the fortunes of the gallant general, the Washington of the South, when he rested after the last decisive battle and retired to his Georgia plantation. In another lies buried his daughter, and in another the gallant Light Horse Harry, who so ably assisted him at Utah Springs, the brave and eloquent Lee. Upon the first marble slab is engraven, in memory of Catherine Miller, widow of the late Major General Nathaniel Green, commander-in-chief of the American Revolutionary Army in the Southern Department in 1783, who died September 2, 1814, aged 59 years. She possessed great talents and exalted virtues. Phineas Miller, Esquire, a native of Connecticut and a graduate of Yale College, who had been engaged by General Green as law tutor to his son, managed the widow's estates after the general's death, and later married her. His grave is here, though unmarked by any stone. And this name revives the memory of one of the greatest inventions of the eighteenth century. Eli Whitney, the inventor of the cotton gin, was born in Westboro, Massachusetts, December 8, 1765. In 1792, he obtained a position as tutor to the children of a Georgia planter, but owing to the imperfect postal regulations, his letter of acceptance was not received, and on arriving in Savannah, he found his place occupied by another. Without means or friends, he was in great want. When his circumstances became known to Mrs. Green, then residing at Mulberry Grove, who, being a lady of benevolent heart, invited him to make her house his home until he should find remunerative employment. One day, while this lady was engaged in working a sort of embroidery called timber work, she complained to young Whitney that the frame she was using was too rough and tore the delicate threads. Anxious to gratify his benefactress, Whitney quickly constructed a frame so superior in every respect that she thought it a great invention. It chanced shortly after that a party of gentlemen, many of them old friends and officers who had served under General Green, met at her house and were discussing the merits and profits of cotton, which had been lately introduced into the state. One of them remarked that unless some machine could be devised for removing the seed, it would never be a profitable crop, the cleaning of one pound of cotton being then a day's work. Mrs. Green, who heard the remark, replied that a young man, a Mr. Whitney, then in her house, could probably help them. She then sent for Whitney, introduced him, extolled his genius, and commended him to their friendship. He set to work under great disadvantages, having to make his tools and even his wires, which at that time could not be had in Savannah. By Mrs. Green and Mr. Miller, he was furnished with abundant means wherewith to complete his machine. It was first exhibited privately to a select company, but it could not long remain a secret, and its fame, which spread rapidly throughout the South, was the cause of great excitement. The shop containing the model was broken open, and the machine was stolen. By this means, the public became possessed of the secret, and before another could be made, a number of machines were in successful operation. A partnership was entered into between Miller and Whitney, and, in 1793, a large area was planted with cotton, in expectation that the new gin would enable them to market it at little expense. In 1795, their shops, which had been removed to New Haven, were destroyed by fire, thus reducing the firm to the verge of bankruptcy. The faith and energy of Mr. Miller are well shown in the following letter, written from Dungeness to Whitney, in New Haven. 
I think we ought to meet such events with equanimity. We are pursuing a valuable object by honorable means, and I believe our measures are such as are justified by virtue and morality. It has pleased Providence to postpone the attainment of this object. In the midst of all the reflections called up by our misfortunes, while feeling keenly sensitive to the loss, injury, and wrong we have sustained, I feel an exultant joy that you possess a mind similar to my own, that you are not disheartened, that you will persevere and endeavor at all hazards to attain the main object. I will devote all my time, all my thoughts, all my exertions, all the fortune I possess, and all the money I can borrow, to compass and complete the business we have undertaken, and if fortune should by any future disaster deprive us of our reward, we will at least have deserved it. While thus embarrassed information came from England that the cotton cleaned by their gins was ruined, Whitney nearly gave way under the strain, and wrote to Mr. Miller at Dungeness. Our extreme embarrassments are now so great that it seems impossible to struggle longer against them, it has required my utmost exertions to exist without making any progress in our business. I have labored hard to stem the strong current of disappointment which threatens to carry us over the cataract, but have labored with a shattered oar, and in vain unless some speedy help come. Life is short at best, and six or seven of its best years are an immense sacrifice to him who makes it. Returning south, he constructed a new model it is said, at Dungeness, with the object in view so to improve upon the old one as to remove the seed without injury to the stable. It was first tried in the presence of Mrs. Green and Mr. Miller, but found lacking in an important particular. Mrs. Green exclaimed, Why, Mr. Whitney, you want a brush! And, with a stroke of her handkerchief, removed the lint. Comprehending her idea at once, he replied, Mrs. Green, you have completed the cotton gin. With the further fortunes of the brave inventor, we have no more to do, as that part of his history, intimately connected with Dungeness, ends here. His subsequent trials, disappointments, triumphs, all the world knows. His friend and partner, who so nobly sustained him, lies buried here, so tradition says, having died in 1806 of lockjaw, caused by running an orange thorn, through his hand while removing trees from Florida to Dungeness. Near the tomb of Mrs. Miller is another. Sacred to pure affection, this simple stone covers the remains of James Shaw. His virtues are not to be learned from perishable marble, but when the records of heaven shall be unfolded, it is believed they will be found written there in characters as durable as the volumes of eternity. Died January 6th, 1820 age thirty-five years. And by the side of this ladder, another marble slab, with this inscription, which explains itself. Louisa C. Shaw, relict of James Shaw, Esquire, and youngest daughter of Major General Nathan Nathaniel Green of the Army of the Revolution, died at Dungeness, Georgia, April twenty-fourth, 1831, aged forty-five years. This ends the record of the residence of the family of General Green at Dungeness. That they made it their home for many years is evident. That they removed here soon after the death of the general is probable. In the division of General Green's possessions, Dungeness became the property of Mrs. Shaw, his youngest daughter. She, dying childless, left it to her nephew, Phineas Miller Nightingale. Mrs. Nightingale, wife of the grandson of General Green, to whom this property was given, was daughter of Rufus King, governor of New York, and granddaughter of Rufus King, minister to Great Britain during the elder Adams's administration. The Nightingales, descendants of General Green, remained in undisturbed possession until the late war, dispensing unbounded hospitality at their princely mansion. During the war, the house was occupied by northern troops until its close, when, through the negligence of some Negro refugees, it was burned. Its ruins alone testified to the wealth of former years, which now is departed, and the broad acreage of untilled fields and the ruined Negro cabins cry out loudly for those who will never return to bless them. 
let us turn once more to that cemetery in the olive grove another stone claims our attention a tablet to the memory of him who pronounced those glowing words first in war first in peace first in the hearts of his countrymen sacred to the memory of general henry lee of virginia oblet twenty five march eighteen eighty etat sixty three in eighteen fourteen General Lee was injured by a mob in Baltimore and never recovered. Early in 1818, he arrived at Dungeness from Cuba, whither he had gone to regain his health. He landed from a schooner at the river landing, a weak, decrepit old man, in whom it would have been difficult to recognize the dashing light horse Harry of the Revolution. A grandson of General Green's, Phineas Miller Nightingale, was loitering near the landing, calling him, General Lee learned who he was, and dispatched him to his aunt, Mrs. Shaw, with the intelligence of his arrival. "'Tell her,' said he, "'that the old friend and companion of General Green has come to die in the arms of his daughter.'" A carriage was sent for him, and he was installed in the southern chamber above the drawing-room, and everything done to alleviate his pain was that the kindest forethought could suggest. He lingered here some two months, and then passed away, and was buried in the family burying ground. His only baggage at the time of his arrival was an old hair-covered trunk nailed round with brass-headed nails. An anecdote is preserved in the family relating to the general's residence there. One of the servants, Sarah by name, commonly called the Duchess from her stately demeanor, incurred his ill-will. General Lee once threatened to throw his boot at her, and the Duchess turned upon him and replied, If you do, I'll throw it back at you. This answer so pleased the old general that he would afterward permit no other servant to wait upon him. Some years after his death, a stone was placed above his grave by his son, General Robert E. Lee, who a few months prior to his death visited his father's grave in company with his daughter. These are some of the associations that cluster about the ruins of Dungeness, giving to those ivy-grown walls, to forest and shore, an interest which mere attractions of scenery and climate could not awaken. End of Dungeness, General Green's Sea Island Plantation by Frederick A. Ober The Pretty Things to be Worn by Mrs. Helen Hooker From Cosmopolitan, Volume 1, 1886 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times British and American Periodical Articles, 1852-1905 to By Various Section 9 As many cotton dresses are made at home, while the more elaborate gowns of cloth, silk, and wool are put into the hands of tailor and modiste, a few hints about making them may not be amiss. The skirts of cotton gowns are cut two yards and a half wide. They are made with deep facing and bound with cotton braid, the color of the dress. The lower edge of the skirt is finished with one or two narrow pleatings or ruffles. If ruffles are used, for the foot trimming, they should be made scant. If pleatings, they should be made quite full. The draperies for such a dress should be long and made in simple fashion. For the front drapery, take one long breadth, if the material is wide, hem it neatly, and drape on to the front of the skirt as an apron. Lay three or four pleats on each side of the apron and fasten them to the under petticoat by buttons and loops. For the back drapery, take two breadths and sew them to the belt. Drape them, and then fasten the loopings in by means of tapes. Made in this way, a dress is much easier to laundry than when the draperies are firmly sewed to the foundation skirt. Kilt skirts are also worn in gingham, chambray, and sateen dresses. A favorite way of making the waist of such dresses is either in a gathered basque or a Norfolk jacket. To make a gathered basque, cut the front of the waist three inches wider than the paper pattern. Father the extra fullness of the neck 
the waistline in the bottom of the basque. The back of the basque is fitted smoothly, ending in several pleats. The basque should be longer in front and back than on the sides. Finish the edge of the basque with a bias piping. Add to the waist a high-standing collar and coat sleeves, fastened with small, ball-shaped pearl buttons. More dressy basques are made by adding reverse of embroidery, and embroidered collars and cuffs, and an apron of all-over embroidery, or cotton lace, either in white or in a color to match the dress. Muslin dresses have round waists, made of lengthwide tucks and lines of insertion, or surplus waists. The waists of dresses that are transparent should, if not white, be lined with the same material as the dress. The skirts are double, and it is only by lining the waist that it can be made to look the same color as the rest of the dress. Sateens are made as elaborately as silks, with whalebones in the waists, steels in the skirts, and intricate draperies. Some of the prettiest sateens are made into French polonaise, or dressy basques and overskirts to be worn over skirts of sura or foulard silk for afternoon toilettes. Figaro jackets, opening over blouse fronts of shirred or pleated sateen or sura, pointed bodices with long, full overskirts, and even velvet vests and skirts reverse, are some of the more elaborate styles displayed. A beautiful white dress may be made of embroidered muslin, either in striped lace, which is the newest fashion, or in flowered embroidery. The waist, made of lengthwise strips of muslin and insertion, should have a low V-shaped lining, and be made in a Russian jacket, with closely fitting position back. The front of the waist should be cut away to show a full gathered vest of embroidered gauze, silk, muslin, or surah. Sometimes the embroidery forms a short basque in the back, with a long polonaise front. Then the back of the basque falls over long, plain breadths of fine muslin. Fine nainsuk dresses should have a petticoat of the same material, made the exact length of the dress. The dress skirt itself should be finished by narrow pleatings of lace or tucked pleatings of muslin. An apron made of the muslin and edged with lace may be fastened at the sides where it is draped by graceful bows of creamy white moriere or satin ribbon. A dog collar of the same ribbon at the throat adds a pretty touch to a white toilette. Many young ladies like the full plain back for dressy muslin robes, but if drapery is desired, a very graceful one is made by using a long wide sash of the muslin finished at the ends with tucks and lace or embroidery. Any of the above styles are pretty for graduating dresses. The lace used for trimming them should be oriental or valenciennes. A charming graduating dress is made of valenciennes net over a white satin slip. This lace may also be found in flouncing width, forty inches wide, and in narrow trimming laces to match. Black lace dresses, which are just as fashionable as ever, are made over colored slips, mauve, rose color, pearl gray, and straw color. The first choice is given by women of the best taste to slips of black sura. Frequently, an old dress of silk or satin may serve as the foundation for such a dress. In such case, from five to eight yards of the piece lace will be required, the quantity depending somewhat on the condition of the lining used. Time was when elderly people wore Quaker gray or black almost exclusively. The prevalent taste for color has changed all that, and now the mother and even grandmothers wear the same colors as the maiden. All of the dark shades of brown, moss green, plum color, and blue are worn by them for street dresses. For house and morning gowns they wear cream white, cardinal, garnet, blue, and lavender. For elaborate, stately gowns, gold and seal brown, pansy purple, black and exquisite combinations of black and white find most favor. These gowns are made with train. The material used is velvet, bengaline, gross grain, or satin. Perhaps the most serviceable of these dresses is a black velvet or gross grain silk, trimmed with chantilly lace 
and jet ornaments, or with a set of real lace in white. Such a dress may be made walking length with a plain full back. A separate train can then be added when desired. Such a train can be hooked on at the belt under the basque and hooked down each side of the skirt. A skirt that is much liked by women inclined to be stout has the front laid in three or five wide box pleats separated by rows of passementerie or braid and very long straight drapery in the back. A pretty afternoon and church dress is made of fine cashmere combined with watered silk. Make a plain under petticoat of the silk and a long polonaise of the cashmere. Make the collar and cuffs of the watered silk and drape the polonaise very high on the left side and a very little on the right. Make part of the back drapery of silk. Simple house dresses are made with a round basque and full skirt of serge or veiling. China silks with a small figure and a good quality of summer silk in a pinhead check and trimmed with velvet ribbon with a feathered edge make lovely cool church dresses for elderly women. The new parasols are large and cast as much shade as sun umbrellas. The fabrics used for them are brocaded, plain, and striped satin. They are either plain or finished at the edge by a frill of lace or a fringe of narrow loops of ribbon. Some of the parasols for carriage use have the sides decorated with embroidery or have white ecru and black lace covers. Satin parasols also reappear and are pretty and inexpensive. The handles of parasols are of natural carved and ebonized wood. White petticoats are very little worn, except for the house and under very thin white dresses. With dark dresses, black or dark skirts are worn. These skirts are of farmer's satin, or cheap quality of black sura, and finished with a narrow pleating. Lighter colored skirts are made of gray and cream moreen or serge. Boots and shoes have broad, low heels, and the toes less pointed than last season. Beautiful hose are displayed in dove gray, dark blue, and black grounds, with tiny blocks of white, cardinal, and gold across the instep. These are to be worn with low shoes, as are also the silk hose with the instep of lace or embroidery. Plain black lisle thread hose remain the most popular for everyday wear with women and children. Gloves need not necessarily match the costume, though they should harmonize with it. It is said that pearl, dove, and all the tints of gray will be much worn this summer. The safest way is to buy the demi-shades of tan and gray, as they can be worn with any color. For evening, pale ecru, lavender, and pearl are first choice. Gloves of good make now come in short-fingered, medium, and long-fingered lengths. The collars of dress waists are worn so high that only the very narrowest of lines of white appears above them. Often this is omitted, and the throat of the dress is finished with a very high jetted dog collar fastened at the side with a bow, or several hooks and eyes. Ruchings, or collars, are, however, much more becoming and ladylike than simply the dress collar. Ruchings may be found in every color and style, orange, pink, blue, and scarlet, hess, and canvas folds in as great a variety. With the round waists so much worn in all materials, all worn belts of beaded galloon fastened in front, with a handsome buckle sewed to the edges of the galloon. If the galloon is not strong enough to stand anywhere, fasten the galloon to a silk belt. Sleeves and petticoat of plush or velvet, with the corsage and overdress of fine wool, are coming into fashion again. It is also said that this is the last season of the draped skirt, and that, ere another winter, clinging perfectly flat dresses will be worn. Already the poof is considerably diminished in size. Many dresses are not draped at all, but fall in plain straight folds. A hood, lined with silk, is added to many of the jackets, and little scarf mantles worn with wool dresses for church and street. End of 
The Pretty Things to be Worn by Mrs. Helen Hooker Beer by S. G. Young From The Galaxy Volume 23, Number 1, January to June 1877 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Beer by S. G. Young British and American Periodical Articles, 1852-1905, to by Various. Section 10. Poets in every age since the time of Anacreon have sung odes in praise of wine. The greatest bards of every clime have sought inspiration in its sparkling depths. But the poet, even German, is yet unborn, who, moved by sweet memories of the nectar of his fatherland, shall chant in rhyme the virtues of his national drink. Yet though its merit has inspired neither of the sister graces, poetry and song, to strike the lyre in its honor, it has had, none the less, an important mission to perform. To its plebeian sister, beer as a healthful beverage, wine must yield the palm. As a common drink, suited to human nature's daily need, it has never been surpassed. If it has nerved no hand to deeds of daring, or struck the scintillating sparks of genius from the human brain, it has added immensely to the health, long life, and happiness of many nations, and is destined to still greater triumphs, as life becomes studied more from a hygienic standpoint. Beer is believed to have been invented by the Egyptians, and is of almost universal use the zone of the cereals being more extended than that of the grape. Greek writers before Christ mention a drink composed of barley, under the name of Zythos. This beverage was not unknown to the Romans, and we find it first mentioned by the historian Tacitus. By the nations of the West it was regarded as a nourishing drink for poor people. They prepared it from honey and wheat, among the ancient Germans and Scandinavians, however, beer was in former times the national beverage, and was prepared from barley, wheat, or oats, with the addition of oak bark, and later of hops. The ancients put bitter herbs in beer, and the present use of hops is in imitation. Modern beer was born at the time of Charlemagne, an epoch at which hops were first cultivated. The earliest writing in which one finds mention of hops as an aroma to beer, is in a parchment of St. Hildegard, abbess of the convent of St. Rupert, at Bingen, on the Rhine. The art of fabricating beer remained for a long time a privilege of convents. The priests drank Pater's beer, while the lighter, or convent beer, was used by the laity. Although beer has been manufactured of all the cereals, barley only can be called its true and legitimate father. Bavaria and Franconia were already in the 14th century celebrated for their excellent beer, and the German cities, of which each one soon had its own brewery, vied with their predecessors in the 15th and 16th centuries. The upper and lower Saxony breweries became well known. The Braunschweiger, Einbecker, Göttinger, Bremer, and Hamburger beer, as well as the breweries of the cities of Versen, Zwicka, Torgo, Merzburg, and Goslar were far and wide celebrated. Bavarian beer has long made the tour of the world. Bach beer from Bavaria and from the Erzberg is exported to Java and China. German lager beer, as a healthy and lightly stimulating beverage, is welcome in both hot and cold countries and it is liked as well by the Russians and Scandinavians as by the inhabitants of the tropics. It is brewed by Germans in all parts of the globe, in Valenciennes, Antwerp, Madrid, Constantinople, and even Australia, Chile, and Brazil. The English commenced later than the Germans to make beer. In 1524, however, they not only brewed beer, but used hops in its fabrication. The Greek and Latin races, which drank wine, had but little taste for beer, 
which divided them from the Germanic races as a sharp boundary. Beer and wine seem to have had an influence in forming the temperament of these widely differing races. While wine excites the nervous system, beer tranquilizes and calms it. The action of a particular kind of daily drink, used for centuries, must in this respect have been more or less potent. Hence, perhaps, the Teutons' phlegm and the Gauls' excitability. There may be said to be three principal types of beer, the Bavarian, Belgian, and English. The Bavarian is obtained by the infusion or decoction of sprouted barley, then by the fermentation of deposit in tubs painted internally with resin. The varieties most appreciated are the Bach and Salvatore beers. The beers of Belgium have the special character of being prepared by spontaneous fermentation, and the process is therefore slow. The principal varieties are the Lambic, the Faro, the March beer, and the Utzid. In the English beer, the must is prepared by simple infusion, and the fermentation is superficial. On account of its great alcoholic richness, it is easily conserved. The ale, the porter, and the stout are the chief varieties of English beer, which differ among themselves only by the diverse proportion of their ingredients and the different degrees of torrefaction of the barley, rendering it more or less brown. In France, only the superficial method of fermentation is employed. In a liter of Strasbourg beer, one finds five one-fourth grams of albumen, forty-five grams of alcohol, and point o nine one of salts. The ordinary Bavarian beer contains three percent of alcohol and six and a half percent of nourishing extracts. The beer, the most sticky to the touch, are the heaviest in volume and the most nutritious. It is historical that in very olden days the Munich city fathers tried the goodness of the beer by pouring it out on a bench and then sitting down in their leather inexpressibles and approved of it only when they remained glued to the seat. In Nuremberg there is a school of brewers, where one may learn all the mysteries of beer brewing. Certain breweries, however, pretend to possess secrets pertaining to the art known exclusively to them. For example, one family near Leipzig is said to have possessed for a century the secret which chemistry has tried in vain to discover of making the famous ghost beer. Good beer, says Dr. Paolo Mantegassa, a celebrated Italian writer on medicine, is certainly one of the most healthy of alcoholic drinks. The bitter tonic, the richness of the alimentary principle which it contains, and its digestibility make it a real liquid food, which, for many temperaments, is medicine. The English beer, which is stronger in spirit than some wines, never produces on the stomach that union of irritating phenomena vulgarly called heat, and for this reason beer is often tolerated by the most weak and irritable persons, and can be drunk with advantage in grave diseases. Laveran, a French physician, counsels it for consumptives, and for nervous thin people in the most diverse climates. In the intoxication by beer there is always more or less stupidity. Beer is by no means favorable to l'esprit. It is doubtful if it has ever inspired the great poets or the profound thinkers who make Germany, in science, the leading country in Europe. Reich, Voigt, and many great writers have launched their anathemas against it as a stimulant beer is less potent than wine or tea and coffee. The forces of soldiers have never been sustained on a fatiguing march, nor can they be incited to a battle by plentiful libations of beer. During the late French-Prussian War, nearly every provision train which left Bavaria carried supplies of beer to the Bavarian troops. It was found very favorable for the convalescent soldiers in the hospitals, but inferior to coffee or wine as a stimulant on the eve of battle. The old chroniclers of Bavaria relate this curious tale of the origin of the celebrated Bach beer. There was one day in olden times at the table of the Duke of Bavaria, as guest, a Brunswick nobleman, 
Now there had long prevailed at the court the custom of presenting to noble guests, after the meal, a beaker of the Bavarian barley juice, not without a warning as to its strength. The Brunswicker received the usual cup, emptied it at a draught, and pronounced it excellent. But, he continued, such barley juice as we brew at home in Brunswick is equaled by no other. Our mum is the king of beers, so that the bravest drinker cannot take two beakers of it without sinking under the table. The duke listened with displeasure to the haughty words of the knight, for he was not a little proud of the brewings of his country, and commanded his cup-bearer, with a meaning look, to challenge him. "'By your leave, Sir Knight,' replied the page, "'what you say is not quite true. If it pleases you and my lord duke, I should like to lay a wager with you.' The duke nodded assent, and the knight, smiling scornfully, challenged the cup-bearer to pledge him. "'Your Brunswick mum,' continued the page, "'may pass as a refreshing drink, but with our beer you cannot compare it, for the best of our brewings is unknown to you. In case, however, you please again to make your appearance at the hospitable court of my gracious lord, I will promise you a beaker of beer which cannot be equaled in any other country of united Christendom. I will drink the greatest bumper that can be found in our court of your mum at one draught, if you can take of our beer, even slowly, three beakers. He who a half hour afterward can stand on one leg and thread a needle shall win the wager and receive from the other a mighty cask of Toker Rebensov. This speech received loud applause, and the Brunswicker laughingly accepted the challenge. After the knight had departed, the duke tapped the page on the shoulder and said, Take care that thou dost not repent thy word, and that the Brunswicker does not win the wager. The first morning in May the Brunswicker rode into the castle, and was welcomed by the duke. All eyes were turned on the cup-bearer who shortly afterward appeared with a suite of pages carrying on a bier two little casks, one bearing the Bavarian arms and the other those of Brunswick. The right to give to the contents of the former a particular name was reserved to the duke. The page produced likewise a monstrous silver bumper and three bakers of the ordinary size. It was long before the bumper was filled to the brim, and then it required two men to raise it to the table. In the meantime, another page placed the three beakers before the knight, who could not suppress a sarcastic laugh at the huge bumper which the page, taking in his strong arms, placed to his lips. As the knight emptied the last beaker, the cup-bearer turned down the bumper. Two needles and a bundle of silk lay on the table. It wanted a few moments of the half-hour, and the Brunswicker ran toward the garden for fresh air. Hardly arrived in the court, a peculiar swimming of the head seized him, so that he fell to the ground. A servant saw him from the window, and hastened out, followed by the court, with the duke in advance. There lay the Brunswicker, and tried in vain to rise. "'By all the saints, Herr Ritter, what has thrown you in the sand?' inquired the duke sympathetically. "'The buck! The buck! The goat! The goat!' murmured the knight with a heavy tongue. A burst of sarcastic laughter echoed in the courtyard. In the meantime, the page stood on one foot, and without swaying, threaded the needle. "'The bock, the bock," repeated the duke, smiling. "'Our beer is no longer without a name. It shall be called bock, that one may take care.' The bock season lasts about six weeks, from May into June. Just before it commences, a transparency of a goat Drinking from a tall, slender glass is placed as a sign before certain beer locals, called in Munich dialect, box stalls, not because goats are kept there, but because wonderful beer, called Bach, is dispensed. He who has not lived in Bavaria can have no idea of what importance beer is in Bavarian life. There are in Munich Germans who exist only for beer, and there have been pointed out to me old gentlemen who have frequented daily the same local for twenty-five or thirty years, and even occupied the same seat, and pounded the same table, 
by way of enforcing their views in discussing the politics of the day. They are called Stumpgast, literally stock guests, and are much honored in their respective locals. The greatest personages do not disdain the meanest locals, provided the beer is good and to their taste. Naked pine tables do not disgust them, nor the hardest benches. Often on the table, skins of radishes, crusts of bread, cigar stumps, tobacco ashes, herring heads, and cheese rinds form a fragrant melange. The inheritors of this precious legacy push it away without undue irritability. Radishes are carried about by old women called radivivers, who do a thriving business besides in nuts and herrings. One cannot find in any other country of the world radishes of such size, tenderness, and flavor, a brown variety inherited by the happy Munkeners with their breweries. Nowhere else does cutting and salting them rank as an art. To prepare one scientifically, they pare it carefully, slit it in three slices nearly to the end, place salt on the top, and draw the finger over it, as if it were a pack of cards. The salt falls between the slices, and when they are pressed together, becomes absorbed. In a German beer local are represented all classes of society. Beer is the great leveler of social distinctions. The foaming glass of King Gambrinus unites all Germans of all states, climates, and professions in a closer brotherhood than the scepter of the Hohenzollerns and links that portion of the Teutonic race over which the stars and stripes throws its protecting folds to the dear fatherland. Fine wines are a perquisite of money. The fortunate aristocrat and the house of Israel, which everywhere waxes fat on the needs of travelers, may sip their champagne, their lacrimae Christi, and their Hochheimer, while less favored humanity contents itself with sour vin ordinaire, but beer is the same for all, and in some breweries each one must search for a glass, rinse it, and present himself in his turn at the shank window, to which there is no royal road. La bière, which a great writer calls ce vin de la réforme, is essentially a democratic drink. It became popular at a time when a fatal blow had been struck at class privileges and priestly exclusiveness. Manfully does a true-hearted Bavarian stand by his brewery, in ill as well as good report. If the beer turns out badly, he does not find it a sufficient reason to desert his local for some other, but rather remains with touching devotion, and anticipates the approaching end of the old beer and the advent of new, with implicit trust and confidence in the future. Some years ago, the Bavarian Post and Railway Conductors distinguished themselves by the mournful zeal with which they notified to the passengers the nearing of the frontier. At each station, they were sorrowfully communicative. The last Barischer, but four gentlemen. Gentlemen, there are only two more real Barischers. Gentlemen, with tears in the voice, the last Barischer. The passengers rushed to the buffet and drank. Even now, with that curious affection with which every Bavarian's heart turns to his mecca of beer, the salutation to a stranger is, Are you going to Munich? Da werden Sie Gott's Bier trinken? You came from Munich? Ach, da haben Sie Gott's Bier getrunken. Even in Beerland there are different kinds of beer, like the Federal Union, one in many and many in one. Between them are sometimes irreconcilable differences, as, for example, between the white and Actian beer of Berlin. The former is made of wheat and is exclusively a summer beverage, and a glass of it is fondly termed as Klein Weiss, a little white one. Perhaps in irony, for it is served in eccentric mammoth tumblers, which require both hands to lift. Then there is the Vienna beer, the antipodes of the Bavarian. The latter must be drunk soon after it is made, while the former must lie many months in the cellar before it is ready for use. In Austria, 
that forcible union of states of clashing interests and nationalities which is not a nation but only a government reposing on bayonets the population is divided between the partisans of king gambrinus and those of bacchus as little as an artist could maintain that he was familiar with the works of the great masters when he had not visited italy so little could a beer drinker assert that he had seen beer rightly drunk when he had not been in munich all over the world beer is regarded as a refreshment but in munich it is the elixir of life the fabled fountain of youth and happiness it is looked upon as nourishment by the lower classes who drink for dinner two masses of it with soup and black bread for the price of the beer they could procure a good portion of meat but they universally maintain that they are best nourished with beer and bread the bavarian drinks to satisfy his thirst that beautiful german gift of god if he is healthy he drinks because it keeps his life juices in their normal state if he is sick and in pain because it is a soothing and harmless narcotic if he is hungry because beer is nourishment if he has already eaten because beer promotes digestion if he is warm because it is cooling and refreshing if he is cold because it warms him if he is fatigued because it is a tonic and sovereign strength renewer if he is angry because beer soothes him and gives him time to consider if he needs courage because beer is precisely the right stimulant where the americans fly to their bitters to tone up the system and enliven the secretions the germans resort to beer and many are of opinion that frequent trips to the box stalls in the spring are more healing than a visit to carlsbad or baden baden where one drinks disgusting water in all circumstances and all moods they drink and are comforted the jews believed that the sacred waves of the jordan were powerful to wash away all human suffering either of the soul or body faith was necessary to this pious healing to the munkener beer is the river of health his faith in it dates from his earliest infancy and he resorts to its beneficent influence at least seven times a day and drinks his last krugel with apparently the same relish as the first the quantity which germans drink is something incredible bavarian students usually take from five to seven masses per day at the german jesuit seminary in prague the novices are allowed daily seven the clericos ten and the priests twelve pints of beer beer is considered good not only for men but for women for girls and boys and even unweaned infants mein krug the munkenart speaks of his natural and human rights he was born with a right to his beer and his krugel as man is born with a right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and equally with these the state must look after this right the krugels or beer mugs of each brewery are inspected by the police to see if the measure is correct and if the ware has no poisonous lead in its composition the royal k is stamped on them by the king's authority the police also examine the contents of the beer with the same zeal as the water or the condition of the sewers the germans as a nation are patient of wrong and peace-loving but the rumor of attacks on beer raises frightful commotion and a riot is often the consequence as well tax air water and fire as beer the fifth element in an ancient neighborhood of munich behind the post and best entered from maximilian street is a little square remarkable for its ugliness all the houses are old and one feels upon entering it as if one had suddenly walked back into the middle ages on the east side stands a time-gray low irregular building resembling in architecture or by its wants of it nothing of the present age this is the royal hof Brauerei. after ten a m a constant stream of thirsty souls flows along the streets and narrow alleys leading toward its dismal-looking portals its beer is celebrated as being the finest in the world and is the standard by which all beers are judged 
It is in the poetry of beer. It is to all other brewings what Shakespeare is to the drama, what the Colosseum is to other antiquities. None of the beer is exported or sold. It is all drunk on the spot, and when it gives out, no other brewery can supply a drop comparable with it. The Parisians, who have heaped every luxury from the poles to the tropics in their capital of the world, have not enough money in the bank of France to purchase a cask of it. It is said that Maximilian II resolved that the best beer in the world should be made at the royal brewery in Munich. It has never been expected that it would yield any revenue, but merely pay its expenses. It is now under the protection of the present king, and the ingredients are inspected by an officer of the royal household. For its dirt, its darkness, its utter want of service, the Hofbrauerei is unequaled in the world, and nowhere else can be found such a mixed society. Entering the low vaulted room, each one looks anxiously about for an empty mug. These are of gray stone, containing a mass, the price of which is seven and a half kreutzers. Spying one, he hastens to secure it from other competitors. The first who reaches it carries it off in triumph to the spring in the anteroom, rinses it, and presents himself behind a queue of predecessors at the shank window, where several pairs of hands are occupied all day long in filling mugs from the great casks within. This accomplished, he returns to the guest room and searches for a seat. If found, it is certainly not luxurious. A wooden bench of pine, stained by time and continual use to a dark dirt color, behind an ancient table. The walls and ceiling are grim with age, and the atmosphere hazy with smoke. The scene baffles description. All classes of society are represented. Side by side with the noble or learned professor, one sees the poorest artisan and the common soldier. Here and there, the picturesque face of an artist is in close proximity to a peasant, and through the smoky atmosphere, one catches the gleam of the scarlet or sky-blue cap of a German student, or the glitter of an epaulet. The Catholic of the most ultramontane stamp is there, as well as the Jew, the Protestant, and the free thinker. Here stands a pilgrim from far America, armed with a Baedeker, and there an Englishman with the inevitable Murray under his arm, too amazed or disdainful to search for a mass. Remarkable, also, are the steady habitues of the place, with Albert Durer-like features which look as if hastily hewn out of ancient wood with two or three blows of a hatchet, or with smoke-dried physiognomies, having a tint like that of a meerschaum pipe, acquired by years of exposure to the thick atmosphere of smoky breweries. They are there, morning, noon, and night, year in and year out. Some talk over the news of the day, but most sit in silence. Not a few make a meal with bread and radishes, or a sausage brought from the nearest pork shop. In Munich a singular and ancient custom prevails. If by chance the cover of a mug is left up, any individual who chooses may seize it and drink the contents. At the Hofbräuerei, I once saw a newly arrived Englishman, carrying the usual red guidebook, quit the room for an instant, leaving uncovered his just-acquired mass of beer. There came along a seedy-looking old gentleman, evidently a stamgast. A gleam of satisfaction stole over his wooden features as he espied the open mug. Pausing a moment, he lifted it to his lips and slowly drank the contents. Setting it down empty, with a face mildly radiating satisfaction, he went his way. Presently, the owner of the beer returned, took his seat, and lifted the mass, without looking, to his lips. With intense astonishment, he put it down again, appeared not to believe the evidence of his senses, applied his glass to his eye, looked with anxiety into his mug, and became satisfied of its emptiness. At his neighbors he cast a quick glance of indignant suspicion, the look of a Briton whose rights were invaded. No one even looked up. Apparently the occasion was too common to excite attention. 
Gradually, his face regained its composure. He procured a new supply, and as the wonderful barley juice disappeared, became again calm and happy. Miraculous mixture! Who would not, under thy benign influence, forget all rancor and bitterness, even though his deadliest enemy sat opposite? In the Haupt und Residenz Stadt München, as Munich is always called in official documents, many of the breweries bear the names of orders of monks, because there the friars in olden days made particularly good beer. The breweries borrowed from them the receipt and the name. Hence, the brewery to the Augustiner, to the Dominicaner, to the Franciscaner, and the Salvatore. New beer is in all cities of America and Europe a simple fact. In Munich it is an important public and private family event concerning each house as well as the entire city. The opening of the Salvatore Brewery in the suburbs of Munich for its brief season of a month in the spring assumes for the inhabitants the importance of a long-anticipated holiday. Thither an eager crowd of townspeople make pilgrimage I was present on one of these auspicious occasions, and found a joyous multitude of more than two thousand persons, filling to overflowing the capacious building, gaily trimmed with evergreens interspersed with the national colors. A band discoursed excellent music, that necessary element, without which no German scene is complete. The waiters, more than usually adroit in supplying the wants of the crowd, carried in their hands fourteen glasses at a time, with professional dexterity. The peculiar delicacy of the occasion, aside from the beer, seemed to be cheese, plentifully sprinkled with black pepper. Late in the evening, the people became more excited and sympathetic, and then it was proposed to sing Herr Fischer, a popular German song of the people. A verse was sung by a few voices as a solo, then followed a mighty chorus from all the persons present. Each one raised the cover of his beer mug at the commencement, and let it fall with a clang at the close of the chorus, with startling effect. In Munich, one half of the inhabitants appear to be engaged in the fabrication of beer, and the entire population in drinking it. It impresses one as being the only industry there. The enormous brewery wagons, drawn by five Norman horses, are ever to be seen. On the trains going from the city there is ordinarily a beer car painted in festive white. It bears an inscription that none may mistake its contents, and perhaps that the peasants may bless it as it passes. It is looked upon with as much reverence as if it bore the Ark of the Covenant. All over Germany, among the most ordinary of birthday and holiday presents, are the elegantly painted porcelain tops for beer glasses. The works of great masters may be found copied in exquisite style for this purpose, as well as illustrations suited to uncultivated tastes. To these pictures there are appropriate mottoes, and often a verse adapted to the comprehension of the most uneducated peasant. A favorite among the Bavarians, judging from the frequency with which it is met with in all parts of Bavaria, represents a peasant in a balcony, waving her kerchief to her lover, departing in a little skiff on an intensely blue sea. Beneath in patois is the dog roll. Beautifully blue is the sea, but my heart aches in me, and my heart will never recover till returns my peasant lover. Equally a favorite is the following. A rifle to shoot, and a fighting ring to hit, and a maiden to kiss, must a lively boy have. The rings to which the rhyme refers are of huge size, of silver, with a sharp-edged square of the same metal. They are heirlooms among the peasants, and are worn on the middle finger. It is the custom in a quarrel to hit one's adversary with the stas ring on the cheek, which it tears open. In Germany, many of the great breweries have summer gardens in the suburbs of the cities. In Berlin, there are magnificent beer garden, where the two most necessary elements of German existence, beer and music, are united. I need only refer to the Hofjager, with its flowers, fountains, miniature lake, and open-air theater, 
where popular comedies are performed. Three times per week there is an afternoon concert by one or two regiment bands. Thither the Germans conduct their families. In the winter there are concert rooms in the cities, where music is married, not to immortal verse, but to beer, and these classical concerts are patronized by people of high respectability. Beer is peculiarly suited to the American temperament, too nervous and sensitive. It is certain that the human race always has, and probably always will, resort to beverages more or less stimulating. The preaching of moralists and the efforts of legislators will not exclude them permanently from our use. It is not in the use, but in the abuse of these, that the difficulty lies. Neither tea nor coffee answers for all temperaments and all occasions as nervous aliments. The extraordinary and increasing diffusion of liquors is one of the social ulcers of modern society, particularly in America. It is unfortunately true that the use of strong alcoholics is increasing every day, to the great detriment of public health and morals. Taken merely to kill time, they often end by killing the individual. One of the great advantages of beer, too much forgotten even by physicians, is that it reverses the influence of alcohol, by which it loses its irritating properties on the mucous membrane of the stomach. The celebrated Dr. Bach, late professor of pathological and anatomy in the university at Leipzig, says, Beer exercises on the digestion, on the circulation, on the nerves, and above all, on the whole system, a beneficial effect. It would be well if Americans would adopt it instead of the innumerable harmful beverages which ruin the health and poison the peace of society. End of Beer by S. G. Young Walt Whitman in Europe by Roman I. Zuboff From The Writer, Volume 6, April 1892 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bologna Times British and American Periodical Articles, 1852-1905 to 1905, by Various Section 11 with the death and burial of Walt Whitman passes away the most picturesque figure of contemporary literature. It is true that in England the name of the poet is more familiar than his poetry, and that students of literature are more conversant with the nature of his writings than are the mass of general readers. Yet the character of the man and the spirit of his compositions were rapidly beginning to be appreciated by, and to sway and influence over, the whole higher intelligence of the country. Considering the man and his works, it is almost surprising to find how easily he did conquer for himself an audience and even admirers in England. He was par excellence a contemporary American, not that American who clings to the puritanic traditions of his English ancestors, but that characteristic product of the new world who looks more with eagerness to the future than with satisfaction on the past, and whose pre-eminent optimism is inspired by his ardent appreciation of the living present. Walt Whitman stood forth as an innovator into such realms, where the rigor of conditions demanded an abstract compliance with rules which were based on absolute truths, and where a swerving from them was evidence of impotence. His unconventional forms, the rhymeless rhythm of his verses, which, in appearance, resembled more a careless prosody than a delicately attuned posy. This alone was enough to provoke, at first, an incredulous smile, even among those whose tastes were endowed with more penetration. But Walt Whitman stood forth, besides, as the representative of a principle which, as yet, is looked upon with suspicion by the old world of the principle of a broad, grand, all-embracing democracy, which elevates manhood above all forms, all conditions, and all limitations. The question where meter comes in, in poetry, 
whether it is simply a means of accentuating rhythm and is not the rhythm itself and whether it is legitimate to do as whitman did to prolong the rhythmic phrase at the expense of meter until the sense is completed all this was a problem for the professors and the critics to decide and they might wrangle as they pleased but here was walt whitman recognizing no beauty higher than creative nature recognizing no law greater than the spontaneous dictates of the moral personality here was walt whitman a pagan a pantheist who recognized more divinity in an outcast human being than in a grandly ordained king who acknowledged nothing higher than the dignity of the human individuality all this was enough to make sober people pause and think if not shudder tis true that some almost all the representative men of literature in england recognized in walt whitman from the first a beauty a grandeur which appealed to and captivated their higher susceptibilities and mental appreciation such critics as george eliot dowden and even matthew arnold and such poets as tennyson swinburne and even william morris have uttered expressions of the warmest appreciation of his great talent but the class of general readers are not endowed with such discrimination and his works till very recently were excluded from the shelves of libraries which were catholic enough to embrace the writings of the earliest saints and the latest productions of zola on the ground that his poetry was too demoralizing for the general public this is not a general statement i have a specific instance in view when in eighteen eighty six i went to the leinster house in dublin the public library of the place and asked for walt whitman's leaves of grass on being informed that they had no copy of it in the library i put down the book in the suggestion list a number of trinity students did the same the matter was brought before the directors at their monthly meeting and it appears it was strenuously objected to by the librarian who pleaded the exclusion of the book on the ground of its being immoral indecent we carried the fight from private discussion to correspondence in the press the editor of the dublin university review put the pages of the magazine at our disposal and it was not until a year afterwards and until considerable pressure was brought on the directors that leaves of grass was admitted into the catalogues of the dublin library but the genuine merit of walt whitman's works as the true inspiration of individualistic genius is always destined to do is rapidly conquering the opposition and prejudice even of those whose obtuse minds seldom discover the intrinsic good motive frequently underlying an indifferent form those whose objections rested on their incapacity of penetrating further than the surface of the headline are rapidly beginning to discern in walt whitman's writings a force a sentiment a moral passion and a natural grandeur that is amply compensating for the occasional roughness or looseness of the expressions he mirrors them in before his death the good old poet had not only the satisfaction of knowing that his writings have been widely read and universally commented on but he had the pleasure of seeing his leaves of grass translated into german by t w rolston of dublin and professor schwartz of dresden of having parts of it translated into French. And a few years ago, Mr. Lee consulted me as to the advisability of rendering them into Russian, parts of the book having already been published in the periodicals of the Russian emigres in Switzerland. Not only this, but his innovations, his genius, have even founded a school, and has a following. The little volume, published some time ago in England, under the title Toward Democracy, by Ed Carpenter, written in the same style as The Leaves of Grass, is also gradually finding its way to the surface of the highest consideration. And such passages as this, when nature is calling to man, I, nature, stand and call to you, though you heed not. Have courage, come forth, O child of mine, that you may see me as a nymph of the invisible air before her mortal beloved 
So I glance before you. I dart and stand in your path, and turn away from your heedless eyes like one in pain. I am the ground. I listen to the sound of your feet. They come nearer. I shut my eyes and feel their tread over my face, etc., etc., or such an outburst as this. Ireland! Liberty's deathless flame leaping on her Atlantic shore are enough to convince the human mind that men who write them can be actuated only by impulses of which genius alone is capable. It is this impulse, this sober, solemn love, pervading the writings of Walt Whitman, which has invested his compositions with a property far transcending in genuine beauty the effusions of those poets whose object in writing is more the display of a capacity for finished manipulation of delicate form than the manifestation of a free conception of a grand spirit. Walt Whitman is spontaneous without being careless. His style is unhesitating. His diction is flowing, smooth, without being searching or verbose. It seems as if his soul were responsive, not plaintively, but appreciatively responsive to all the chords, influences, and objects of nature, and that his imagination were absorptive enough to embrace and love, and reflect all changes and transitions of light and shadow in nature and life, particularly in the inner human life. For Walt Whitman's love for humanity, permeating all his writings, has more grandeur than the most heroic of classic epics. End of Walt Whitman in Europe by Roman I. Zuboff When I Knew Stephen Crane by Willa Cather From the Library, June 23, 1900 From a Collection of Stories, Reviews, and Essays This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times British and American Periodical Articles, 1852-1905, to 1905, by Various. Section 12 It was, I think, in the spring of 94 that a slender, narrow-chested fellow, in a shabby gray suit, with a soft felt hat pulled low over his eyes, sauntered into the office of the managing editor of the Nebraska State Journal and introduced himself as Stephen Crane. He stated that he was going to Mexico to do some work for the bachelor syndicate and get rid of his cough, and that he would be stopping in Lincoln for a few days. Later he explained that he was out of money and would be compelled to wait until he got a check from the East before he went further. I was a junior at the Nebraska State University at the time and was doing some work for the State Journal in my leisure time, and I happened to be in the managing editor's room when Mr. Crane introduced himself. I was just off the range. I knew a little Greek and something about cattle and a good horse when I saw one, and beyond horses and cattle I considered nothing of vital importance except good stories and the people who wrote them. This was the first man of letters I had ever met in the flesh, and when the young man announced who he was I dropped into a chair behind the editor's desk where I could stare at him without being too much in evidence. Only a very youthful enthusiasm and a large propensity for hero-worship could have found anything impressive in the young man who stood before the managing editor's desk. He was thin to emaciation. His face was gaunt and unshaven. A thin, dark mustache straggled on his upper lip. His black hair grew low on his forehead and was shaggy and unkempt. His gray clothes were much the worse for wear, and fitted him so badly it seemed unlikely he had ever been measured for them. He wore a flannel shirt and a slovenly apology for a necktie, and his shoes were dusty and worn gray about the toes and were badly run over at the heel. I had seen many a tramp printer come up the journal stairs to hunt a job, but never one who presented such a disreputable appearance as the story-maker man. He wore gloves, which seemed rather a contradiction to the general slovenliness of his attire, but when he took them off to search his pockets for his credentials, I noticed that his hands were singularly fine, long, white, and delicately shaped, with thin, nervous fingers. 
I have seen pictures of Aubrey Beardsley's hens that recalled Crane's very vividly. At that time, Crane was but twenty-four and almost an unknown man. Hamlin Garland had seen some of his work and believed in him, and had introduced him to Mr. Howells, who recommended him to the Bachelor Syndicate. The Red Badge of Courage had been published in the State Journal that winter, along with a lot of other syndicate matter, and the grammatical construction of the story was so faulty that the managing editor had several times called on me to edit the copy. In this way, I had read it very carefully, and through the careless sentence structure, I saw the wonder of that remarkable performance. But the grammar certainly was bad. I remember one of the reporters who had corrected the phrase, It don't, for the tenth time, remarked savagely, If I couldn't write better English than this, I'd quit. Crane spent several days in the town, living from hand to mouth, and waiting for his money. I think he borrowed a small amount from the managing editor. He lounged about the office most of the time, and I frequently encountered him going in and out of the cheap restaurants on 10th Street. When he was at the office, he talked a good deal in a wandering, absent-minded fashion, and his conversation was uniformly frivolous. If he could not evade a serious question by a joke, he bolted. I cut my classes to lie in wait for him, confident that in some unwary moment I could trap him into serious conversation that if one burned incense long enough and ardently enough, the oracle would not be dumb. I was maupassant mad at the time, a malady particularly unattractive in a junior, and I made a frantic effort to get an expression of opinion from him on Le Bonheur. Oh, you're moping, are you? he remarked with a sarcastic grin, and went on reading a little volume of Poe that he carried in his pocket. At another time I cornered him in the funny man's room, and succeeded in getting a little out of him. We were taught literature by an exceedingly analytical method at the university, and we probably distorted the method, and I was busy trying to find the least common multiple of Hamlet, and the greatest common divisor of Macbeth, and I began asking him whether stories were constructed by cabalistic formulae. At length, he sighed wearily and shook his drooping shoulders, remarking, Where did you get all that rot? Yarns aren't done by mathematics. You can't do it by rule any more than you can dance by rule. You have to have the itch of the thing in your fingers, and if you haven't, well, you're damned lucky, and you'll live long and prosper. That's all. And with that, he yawned and went down the hall. Crane was moody most of the time. His health was bad, and he seemed profoundly discouraged. Even his jokes were exceedingly drastic. He went about with the tense, preoccupied, self-centered air of a man who was brooding over some impending disaster, and I conjectured vainly as to what it might be. Though he was seemingly entirely idle during the few days I knew him, his manner indicated that he was in the throes of work that told terribly on his nerves. His eyes, I remember, as the finest I have ever seen, large and dark and full of luster and changing lights, but with a profound melancholy always lurking deep in them. They were eyes that seemed to be burning themselves out. As he sat at the desk, with his shoulders drooping forward, his head low, and his long white fingers drumming on the sheets of copy-paper, he was as nervous as a racehorse fretting to be on the track. Always, as he came and went about the halls, he seemed like a man preparing for a sudden departure. Now that he is dead, it occurs to me that all his life was a preparation for sudden departure. I remember once, when he was writing a letter, he stopped and asked me about the spelling of a word, saying carelessly, I haven't time to learn to spell. Then, glancing down at his attire, he added with an absent-minded smile, I haven't time to dress, either. It makes an awful slice out of a fellow's life. He said he was poor, and he certainly looked it, but four years later, when he was in Cuba, drawing the largest salary ever paid a newspaper correspondent, he clung to the same untidy manner of dress, and his ragged overalls and buttonless shirt were eyesores to the immaculate Mr. Davis, in his spotless linen and neat khaki uniform, 
with his Gibson chin always freshly shaven. When I first heard of his serious illness, his old throat trouble, aggravated into consumption by his reckless exposure in Cuba, I recalled a passage from Matterlink's essay, The Predestined, on those doomed to early death. Quote, As children, life seems nearer to them than to other children. They appear to know nothing, and yet there is in their eyes so profound a certainty that we feel they must know all. In all haste, but wisely and with minute care, do they prepare themselves to live, and this very haste is a sign upon which mothers can scarce bring themselves to look. Unquote. I remember, too, the young man's melancholy and his tenseness, his burning eyes, and his way of slurring over the less important things, as one whose time is short. I have heard other people say how difficult it was to induce Crane to talk seriously about his work, and I suspect that he was particularly averse to discussions with literary men of wider education and better equipment than himself, yet he seemed to feel that this fuller culture was not for him. Perhaps the unreasoning instinct which lies deep in the roots of our lives, and which guides us all, told him that he had not time enough to acquire it. Men will sometimes reveal themselves to children, or to people whom they think never to see again, more completely than they ever do to their confreres. From the wise we hold back alike our folly and our wisdom, and for the recipients of our deeper confidences we seldom select our equals. The soul has no message for the friends with whom we dine every week. It is silenced by custom and convention, and we play only in the shallows. It selects its listeners willfully, and seemingly delights to waste its best upon the chance wayfarer who meets us in the highway at a faded hour. There are moments, too, when the tides run high or very low, when self-revelation is necessary to every man, if it be only to his valet or his gardener. At such a moment I was with Mr. Crane. The hoped-for revelation came unexpectedly enough. It was on the last night he spent in Lincoln. I had come back from the theater and was in the journal office writing a notice of the play. It was eleven o'clock when Crane came in. He had expected his money to arrive on the night mail, and it had not done so, and he was out of sorts and deeply despondent. He sat down on the ledge of the open window that faced on the street, and when I had finished my notice, I went over and took a chair beside him. Quite without invitation on my part, Crane began to talk, began to curse his trade from the first throb of creative desire in a boy to the finished work of the master. The night was oppressively warm. One of those dry winds that are the curse of that country was blowing up from Kansas. The white western moonlight threw sharp blue shadows below us. The streets were silent at that hour, and we could hear the gurgle of the fountain in the post-office square across the street, and the twang of banjos from the lower veranda of the Hotel Lincoln, where the colored waiters were serenading the guests. The drop-lights in the office were dull under their green shades, and the telegraph sounder clicked faintly in the next room. In all his long tirade, Crane never raised his voice. He spoke slowly and monotonously, and even calmly, but I have never known so bitter a heart in any man as he revealed to me that night. It was an arraignment of the wages of life, an invocation to the ministers of hate. Incidentally, he told me the sum he had received for the red badge of courage, which I think was something like ninety dollars, and he repeated some lines from the Black Riders, which was then in preparation. He gave me to understand that he led a double literary life, writing in the first place the matter that pleased himself, and doing it very slowly. In the second place, any sort of stuff that would sell. And he remarked that his poor was just as bad as, as it could possibly be. He realized, he said, that his limitations were absolutely impassable. What I can't do, I can't do at all, and I can't acquire it. I only hold one trump. He had no settled plans at all, 
He was going to Mexico wholly uncertain of being able to do any successful work there, and he seemed to feel very insecure about the financial end of his venture. The thing that most interested me was what he said about his slow method of composition. He declared that there was little money in story writing, at best, and practically none in it for him, because of the time it took him to work up his detail. Other men, he said, could sit down and write up an experience while the physical effect of it, so to speak, was still upon them, and yesterday's impressions made today's copy. But when he came in from the streets to write up what he had seen there, his faculties were benumbed, and he sat twirling his pencil and hunting for words like a schoolboy. I mentioned the red badge of courage, which was written in nine days, and he replied that, though the writing took very little time, he had been unconsciously working the detail of the story out through most of his boyhood. His ancestors had been soldiers, and he had been imagining war stories ever since he was out of knickerbockers, and in writing his first war story he had simply gone over his imaginary campaigns and selected his favorite imaginary experiences. He declared that his imagination was hidebound. It was there, but it pulled hard. After he got a notion for a story, months passed before he could get any sort of personal contract with it, or feel any potency to handle it. The detail of a thing has to filter through my blood, and then it comes out like a native product. But it takes forever, he remarked. I distinctly remember the illustration, for it rather took hold of me. I have often been astonished since to hear Crane spoken of as the reporter in fiction, for the reportorial faculty of superficial reception and quick transference was what he conspicuously lacked. His first newspaper account of his shipwreck on the filibuster Commodore off the Florida coast was as lifeless as the copy of a police court reporter. It was many months afterwards that the literary product of his terrible experience appeared in that marvelous sea story, The Open Boat, unsurpassed in its vividness and constructive perfection. At the close of our long conversation that night, when the copy-boy came in to take me home, I suggested to Crane that in ten years he would probably laugh at all his temporary discomfort. Again his body took on that strenuous tension, and he clenched his hands, saying, I can't wait ten years. I haven't time. The ten years are not up yet, and he has done his work and gathered his reward and gone. Was ever so much experience and achievement crowded into so short a space of time? A great man dead at twenty-nine. That would have puzzled the ancients. Edward Garnett wrote of him in the Academy of December 17, 1899. I cannot remember a parallel in the literary history of fiction. Maupassant, Meredith, Henry James, Mr. Howells, and Tolstoy were all learning their expression at an age when Crane had achieved his and achieved it triumphantly. He had the precocity of those doomed to die in youth. I am convinced that when I met him he had a vague, premonition of the shortness of his working day, and in the heart of the man there was that which said, That thou doest, do quickly. At twenty-one, this son of an obscure New Jersey rector, with but a scant reading knowledge of French and no training, had rivaled in technique the foremost craftsman of the Latin races. In the six years since I met him, a stranded reporter, he stood in the firing line during two wars, knew hair-breadth escapes on land and sea, and established himself as the first writer of his time in the picturing of episodic, fragmentary life. His friends have charged him with fickleness, but he was a man who was in the preoccupation of haste. He went from country to country, from man to man, absorbing all that was in them for him. He had no time to look backward. He had no leisure for camaraderie. He drank life to the lees, but at the banquet table, where other men took their ease and jested over their wine, he stood a dark and silent figure, sombre as Poe himself, not wishing to be understood, and he took his portion in haste, with his loins girded, and his shoes on his feet, and his staff in his hand, like one who must depart quickly.
End of When I Knew Stephen Crane by Willa Cather End of British and American Periodical Articles, 1852-1905, to by Various.